All right, everybody ready? Is this the second one? Second one. So much. All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. All right, there we go. Mayor Bishop? Here. Mayor Pro Tim Loa? Here. Council Members Olson? Here. Betancourt? Here. Alakon? Here. And Commissioners Betts? Here. And Fragasane? Here. We have a former. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That takes us to the Pledge of Allegiance and Moment of Silence. Mayor Pro Tem Loa, can you please lead us in that? Please rise, uh, place your hand over your heart, and uh, after the uh, pledge, we will have a moment of silence for our first responders, our military, and everyone who is serving the nation in capacities that put them at risk. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor. All right, item number four, public comment rules. Madam Clerk, will you please re read those rules into the record? Ladies and gentlemen, may I please have your attention. The meeting of the Palmdale City Council is now in order. A code of conduct will now be read, and we request that you comply with it to ensure the efficient administration of the meeting. Members of the public, it is your right to participate in today's City Council meeting, and the Council encourages such participation. However, the right of the public to address the council must be balanced with the need to ensure that public comment does not interfere with the orderly course of the council's business. All are reminded to abide by the following rules. Speakers must cease speaking immediately when their time has ended. Public comment on agenda items must relate to the subject matter of that item. General public comment is limited to subjects within the jurisdiction of the council. Public comment does not include the right to engage in a dialogue with council members or staff. Please remain respectful of the form and refrain from uttering, writing, or displaying profane, personal, threatening, derogatory, demeaning, or other abusive statements towards the council, any member thereof, staff, or any other person. Members of the audience should be respectful of the views expressed by speakers, staff, and council members, and may not excessively clap, cheer, whistle, or otherwise disrupt the orderly conduct of the meeting. Any person engaging in conduct that disrupts the meeting is subject to being removed from the council meeting. Finally, if you witness conduct or behavior by other members of the public that disrupts your ability to remain engaged or participate in this meeting, please notify city staff. Thank you for your cooperation. All right, thank you very much. City Manager, are there any items to pull from the agenda on this uh, today? Staff would like to pull 7.5 and put it over to a later date, please. Okay. Pulling item 7.5. Let the record show. Thank you very much. And uh, Madam Clerk, uh, can you please read the public participation and code of conduct in the record before we start public comment? Now is the time for public participation on items listed on the consent calendar. I items section 6, section 7, and also the closed section, section 12. All right, Madam Clerk, do we have any speaker cards? We have a comment for Linda London, item 6.2. Okay.
Okay, six point. Hi, I'm Linda London. Well. Nice seeing you all. Nice happy faces. Um, I'm not really speak. I'm speaking to that, but not necessarily the space rent. Uh, I'm a resident there at the at Boulders at the lake, and uh, but I'm speaking for myself and for several other park residents that have brought to me certain things that are of some issues with them regarding the park. Okay. Um, I'm a resident. I've been there for since 1987. I was there actually when it was called um, Rolling Hills Estates and it was privately owned. So I've been around for a while and I'm a real estate uh, broker. been over 30 years in the business. I sell and list a lot of manufactured homes in throughout the valley here. Uh, the I've attended some council meetings regarding when you got when the city was purchasing the park, and um, I, historically the parks have always been maintained well, managed well. Things have been fixed, problems have been addressed, and uh, the residents uh, addressing the residents' concerns. And also in the past, there's been many concerns that have been taken care of um, before residents could even complain about anything. In my uh, experience with selling in mobile home parks throughout the valley, I know what a park looks like when it's uh, not being taken care of. And I live there, obviously, I see things, I drive through the park, um, and I can tell when things are kind of not where they should be. The values can be dropped a lot with homes in a park that's not being maintained. And uh, the boldest parks are the most desired parks in the whole valley because of their location, their space rents, uh, and the values of those homes accelerate all the time. I used to sell um, repos in there for $40,000. I'm, I'm tying up? Okay, all right. Anyway, there are some packages there that I'd like you to look through, and if you, if you have any questions, you can give me a holler. Okay, okay we'll do. Thank you. I feel like we'll be having a little bit of discussion on this, so okay. stay tuned. Okay, any other speaker cards? Michelle Curly Rear. Okay. Good evening, council members. Um, I also live at Boulders at the Lake. I've been there for seven years. I take care of my mother, um, who is 81 years old. When I'm not working, I hold two jobs. I work for one of the school districts out here. When I'm done with that, I go in home with a student and care for them in their home, um, doing physical therapy. When I get home from work, there is, my street is quite sad because we have a lot of kids on the street. I don't mind kids, I work with kids all day. When I get home, I don't want to have to parent someone else's children. And the kids, I'm surrounded from my right side, across the street diagonal, and then down the street a little bit more are all teenagers. No supervision. They're outside till 10 o'clock at night, many times making a lot of noise. Again, I'm getting home from work about 5 or 6 o'clock at night. My mother is there during the day, and when those kids are not going to school, because they haven't at times, um, it's creating noise for my mom. And I know that there's a noise factor we all cannot control. There's no monitoring system. There's no accountability. And it's heartbreaking because when I took my mother to this park and we drove through it, we absolutely loved it. We fell in love. I wanted to, my mother to be somewhere where she's going to be happy, where I don't have to put her in a home care somewhere, some facility. That's. I left you all packets. If you look through those, there's one vehicle that is constantly parked on the street across from me diagonally that is an issue because other people 
they're they're impeding the traffic. Okay, hey, thank you. Can you just clarify which is sure. your packet, the red or the blue? It's the red one, or the blue one. Oh, the blue shell. one. The blue one is yours, the and blue. the red one is Jesus. yours, ma'am. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any other speakers? We have Gus Camacho, item seven point two. Okay. I guess. Hello, hello everyone. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the council, Mayor, uh, do you want me to speak now or do you want to run, run this spot up? I'm not sure about the process. Uh, now it's good. Right now it's okay? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I am representing myself, Gus Camacho, Camacho Auto Sales, uh, Camacho Mitsubishi. I'm a member of the Palmdale Auto Mall. Long term uh, Antelope Valley resident, 51 years, and a small local business owner. Uh, I want to start off by thanking the city council for working with our auto mall in the past on a lot of different projects. Our auto mall uh, generates, um, is one of the highest generator generators of sales tax revenue for the city. Money that goes into our parks, our roads, and of course uh, security, state, you know, the sheriffs and whatnot. Um, it's been tough guys. Uh, we've seen a big drop in sales in the last couple months. Part of it's the economy, part of it's um, rates and some other issues, uh, but we are um, looking forward to uh, bringing those numbers up and I know the city's put together a great plan to do some marketing. Um, one of the great things that we did here is back during COVID. Um, I know during COVID uh, things were tough for a lot of people and the city came up with a, a great program that we partnered with We're doing some gift cards. We were able to generate some additional sales, tr foot traffic to the auto mall. At the same time, we were able to stimulate the local economy with some gift cards probably one of, the, one of the best programs that I've, I've ever seen. So we greatly appreciate those type of programs we've done in the past, and we're really looking forward to being able to do a lot more uh, program with the city to not only help uh, ourselves, but obviously help the local economy and, and help all the other small businesses that are in our town. Um, we ask that you support uh, the um, measure, and thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Any other uh, comments, Madam Clerk? Eugene Hernandez. Okay. Speaking on item 7.3 and 12.2 in this at this time. Um, I'd like to say that this is a very ingenious scheme by uh, Richard Loeb and Austin Bishop to devote half a million dollars to this auto mall of Camacho and that you are going to benefit from. I hope you got your deposit slips right with the correct number. You get 250000 each. As far as the, the uh, honesty of Camacho, I have heard many stories that the minute you, you, you do not, you, you pass the, the time to pay, they shut your engine off. This man is just a person who's taking advantage of the community. And you guys are going to benefit from it because you're the ones taking measures, taking measure AV funds that should go to nonprofits to this auto, private auto man who doesn't give a anything to the back to the community but you two are on the board so you are are well off right right richard right austin you don't care that the lord's huerta is not funded salvo is not funded other nonprofits are not funded just so long as you got your little take of the city funds that belong to the community you know half a million dollars should not be going to camacho auto sales it's outrageous that you are putting this up and thinking that we don't know what you're doing we absolutely know this undertaking this, this deceitful act of, of giving public funds to a private exploiter of people instead of funding nonprofit agencies in this community there's homeless people out in the community there's poor people out in the community but you two have lined up your beds with Camacho. Have a good night. All right, do we have any other speakers? No more speaker cards for this section, Mayor and Council. Okay. Sorry, I didn't have time to write down the subject. Uh, yeah, uh, I found out that Boulders has um, rent control and rent subsidies. Well, this has been a huge disaster in other cities. But of course, we can do it better? I don't know. Um, I also have to agree with Mr. Hernandez about um, marketing. Marketing with taxpayer money. Maybe that's not what 
the public pays taxes to do is to help market the auto mall. Maybe they want the infrastructure to be repaired, maintained, and improved. At least that's what I think. Um, also, uh, I really like the suggestion about town hall meetings. I think that's a great idea. I went to hear Mr. Lois speak the other day. Unfortunately, he was able to make it. I hope they'll be able to reschedule. But town halls would be great. A dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No more speaker cards for this section. Okay. I don't know what uh, Mr. Hernandez is talking about when he says that um, I am receiving any kind of a kickback or money or anything of the sort. I'm not on the take to anyone. I have to refute that with as much force as I possibly can. I don't know where you come up with that information, Mr. Hernandez, but it is completely false. And I really think it's beneath your dignity to make stupid accusations like that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, may, just in the case, I'm not actually sure what all of you beautiful people are here to speak about or to listen in about, but if you are here, in fact, for the mobile home rent increase, now is your opportunity to speak. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to hear your comment uh, later. So if, you, if, if that's what you're here to speak about, now is the time. Is there a CC? CC? How you doing? Good afternoon. I'm going to make this real quick because there's three things I want to touch real quick. In regards to the boulders, I've been in for almost 20 years. Um, I personally, we've had our ups and we've had our downs. Um, I'm very appreciative to have been part of that community. Uh, Chris and I used to run the uh, Palmdale Youth Group in regards to the city. Um, also, so I believe that we, we, we can work, probably work on that, maybe see if we can get something for the kids to do. I know that's a big problem here in Palmdale with not just our youth in our, in our communities, but also those getting out of school and stuff like that. So maybe we can work on putting something together for our aged out youth, you know, and children that are, are younger at the same time. Um, one of the other things I would like to touch bases on is that, oh yes, thank you for the lights and stuff that you did do for the park. You did come through whatever we asked for. Um, I do have to acknowledge that, so thank you for that. Also, um, I wanted to thank you for ACT. I've been a part of this, um, our shelter here in Palmdale since November, since they started. I am so grateful that um, they have been allowed to allow me to be a part of their program. I have to tell you that it works. It is working, so I just want to give a big shout out to ACT. Thank you so much, and the City Council for being a part of that. Thank you. Thank you for your positive feedback. Any anybody else would like to speak? Seeing none. So we're going to move on. Commissioners, would you like to pull any items from the housing consent calendar? Yes, I, we need to uh, recuse ourselves on item six point two. Okay. For uh, both of our. For uh, for Augustans and Bats, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, so you guys will need to walk Step off. Step out. Okay. I, actually, you know what? Before you do that, let's go ahead and so we're going to pull item six two. So can I get a motion to approve the remaining balance of six one and six three? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Let's go ahead and vote into the computer system. There you go. <laughs> are we going to go by the system or not? We, we are not. So, oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Let's do a verbal vote. Okay. And then we will vote by the system. Okay. We're using half of it. The okay. motion will be <laughs> So the first. It's a hybrid. The first. <laughs> the first. The first what? The first motion. I think at Krogerson's, we had the right. motion by Krogerson's, yes, the second it. from it. Because we're doing it verbally. Yeah, now. we're going to do a voice vote. So we have a motion and a second. Thank you. Everyone in agreement, say aye. 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 I'm going to heads, you're going to vote. What is going on here? Start voting. Okay. Thank you. Motion. 
motion passes unanimously. There we go. So we got it. So verbal, motion and second, and vote in the computer. Yes. Okay. Just like always. And, and before they walk out of the room, if that's what you were planning to do, I would like to ask a question of our city attorney. So we've got two tenant members um, of this, this commission, and they both have feedback. I know, I know um, the commissioner to my right has some, some thoughts on this matter. Um, I think part of their role on, on this, this housing authority um, is to provide that feedback and to sort of be the voice of the, the, the voice of the, the tenants at our various parks. I know, however, I know that this will directly affect them um, because it will it affects every tenant uh, in, in one of our in one of our locations. So are we able to hear from them as members of the public if they step away or? Yeah, the, the, the law is pretty clear. Um, they will have to remove themselves from the dais, from the body, but they retain the right, the individual right, not as a housing authority member, not as, as any government, but as a resident, as an individual, uh, the same right to speak, the three minutes, whatever it is, they may. So they don't have to leave, yeah, but everybody know they're not here as government. They're here as individuals. And then secondary, since we closed public comment on this item on the consent calendar, can we do we need to make a motion to reopen um, comment so to allow them? Right, you would. Okay, so Should I wish to speak. Yeah, let's ask them if they wish to speak. I've already or, shared my concerns before we even had any I've meetings. Heard those right. concerns. Yeah. Would you guys wish and to speak as members of the public? Um, Ms. Betts? I would maybe like to say a, a couple of things. She has a whole she was listening to okay. this matter. Do you okay. Here? No, no, I would I think it'd be most appropriate for you to step off the dais and then go into the audience as a member of the public. All right, so while we transition, I'm happy to move to reopen public comment on item six point two. Okay, what's the best way? I think you, you want should we have public comment I'll first? I'll second that motion to reopen public comments. Okay. You can just reopen. And we'll do a voice for the okay. voice. All right, everyone in agreement, say aye. 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 Okay, so Ms. Betts, would you, um, <laughs> yeah, to the podium, in the audience, and then we'll hear from, we'll, or we'll hear from you, and then we'll have our discussion. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> now down here as a, as a tenant. Um, my concern is the um, removal of the cap. We used to have it where um, when we did the rent increases, it would be $100, and then everybody would get raised up. The people would come in at the new rate, which is now proposed at 650 which is a 61% increase in the rent that we currently have, which also has an effect on our housing prices because when that rent goes up, our prices are going to go down as far as our, our equity in our homes. So I think that the characterization is probably about $10 for every $100 of rent increase or something like that. Or it was about $25,000, whatever. I didn't bring my notes, but I have to say that it's, with a $250 rent increase, it'll be an, a decrease in our equity in our homes of about $25,000. Because obviously we're in, we're selling not right now at four hundred dollars for a space rent and the two hundred fifty dollar increase is going to affect people's decisions to either come in or their ability to have enough income to be able to pay. Our our mobiles are going for pretty high price right now. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. You know, I'm not planning on going anywhere. So I'm just speaking for other people that this may affect that may be thinking about leaving the park to do other things and that they'll, they will probably uh, experience a decrease. The other thing that I wanted to say is when the, the cap goes away and we can just continue to raise rent, what does that do as far as everybody coming to talk about rent increases? There won't be anything to talk about. Would, would, there, be, would there be a need actually to have anybody come and talk? Because people come and talk when you're talking about money, but they don't necessarily come and talk when what, what else do we have to discuss other than things need to be taken care of in the park, which we don't need to come to the city council to do, do we? Just a question. So that's what I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. So 
We're going to close public comment, and then I'm going to invite Sophia up for a staff report to give us a little bit more information, what the numbers look like, and a little history on this. All right, Sophia. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The uh, item before you is a request to approve the revision to the Housing Authority self-imposed maximum space rent for the Boulders Mobile Home Parks for the income qualifying spaces and to establish a space rent subsidy program for the Boulders Mobile Home Parks and to authorize the Authority Executive Director or her designee to review and approve non-substantial revisions for annual space rent increases and the Boulders Mobile Home Park space rent subsidy program. So for, um, since 2008, the maximum space rent has been at $400. And by 2013, the majority of the residents reached that um, level of $400 per space per month. So there has not been a space increase, a, a rent, there has been not an increase in the space rent for about 10 years. So that has been stable, but the cost of operating the parks has increased. And especially post-pandemic, uh, many of the costs of supplies for maintenance, including wood um, and, you know, and other things, have, and um, wages, have gone up. So they have gone up about 17 and 21 percent, depending on the parks. And so the $400 is not keeping up with the cost of operations. And therefore, without a space increase, rent, space rent increase, we would not be able to uh, keep the parks at the level they are at and in the um, condition and with the amenities that we provide. So we are asking to remove the cap. Um, anyone with a, if their existing leases, those remain in place. And those currently have the greater of 2% or 50% of the CPI increase. So on average, over the last 17 years, 2% would have been the, um, the increase per year. But they did not experience that because it, they had reached the cap. So we are asking that we do not have a cap in place so that we do not come back to the situation of if for some reason we do not come back for, uh, to ask for a cap to be increased, that the costs are going up and we're not addressing um, the space rent to um, cover those costs. The three parks, all of their operations are covered by the space rents and any revenue produced at the parks. There is no subsidies to the parks um, for any of their operating costs. Um, the uh, average um, in Los Angeles County, average monthly rent is $1,103 space rents per month. In the Antelope Valley, they range from $450 to $920. And, new, and, and um, those parks under the Palmdale Space Rent Control Ordinance range from $379 to $1,200 for those for new people renting um, units or, and for space rent, monthly space rent. The, um, the, the increases under the rent control ordinance have ranged from 1.09% to 4.93%, and we're talking over the last 20 years. What we are asking for also is that new leases that come in come in at the higher space rent of 650 per month with a 3% increase. Uh, we do not have a high turnover in units at these three parks because uh, they are the better parks. And our residents, when we had our community meetings with three parks prior to bring this before you, have expressed that they appreciate the amenities and they appreciate the condition of the parks in comparison to others that they have seen. So um, staff is available. For, oh, the other thing. My apologies. One of the concerns that they ha the residents have provided was with the increase, many are on fixed income. They came there to retire. So therefore, an uh, increase can be, um, even a small increase, may, um, may be something that, of concern for certain households. So we have, are implementing a um, subsidy program that would cover the increase. And this would be provided out of operations. So it's not coming from a subsidy from any other organization, but it will come from operations. So it will be limited in how many can participate in it, 
But at this time, for a 2% increase on $400 per month space rent is $8 per month, which would be $96 for the year, if it's at 2%. And we did calculate that it would take about 10 to 12 years to reach a $100 increase if it averages 2% per year. So this is still a very slow increase for our current residents. Um, so we are sensitive to what they need, but we are also sensitive of the cost of operating the parks and wanting to keep um, all the amenities in place. Staff's available for questions. All right. I was going to thank you for handling this with its sensitive nature because anything, especially dealing with increases or rent increases, can be detrimental to um, people in these parks. Even the smallest increases, I remember this came before the city council a couple years ago, and we decided since it was during the pandemic and the, the future was a little questionable, we decided to postpone those increases. And then here we are now a couple years later looking at it as reserves have gone down even further, and we want to make sure to... Uh, preserve the integrity and the quality of the parks. Um, here we are with the increase, but thank you for that, for the subsidies, for the very um, thorough explanation about how it increases only $8 per month, and then it takes a long time for it to reach that maximum. I'll, I'll defer to, my, to, the, to the council. I'll start with my left. I have three questions. First of all, if they get um, rental assistance, how long are they able to do that? Is it one year, two year, three year? How long is that available to them? It will be based on the availability of funds. Okay. So um, it, in initially, with it being eight dollars uh, per month, there are more that more people that may be need, needing it, and we're looking at those who are most needy, uh, needing of this, who um, do not have reserves, do not have family. And then, so with, with the rent that you, you take for the three mobile home parks, is that pooled into one fund that takes care of them, or each specific mobile home park has their own fund for their maintenance and, and services and amenities? Each park, um, space rent, supports the operations of that park. Of that they do not cross over between parks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and my last question is, what is the population? I, I don't know if you have a, like a whole population of all three combined, or if you know the population, how many... How many spaces are in each of those mobile home parks, approximately? 223, 293, and 338. I, was I think it's in here, it says 786. That's in total. She was asking each part. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mayor Pertemba. Yes, thank you. Uh, have you had an opportunity to look at uh, the brochures that were handed out? I have not been provided that information. Okay, I'll just give you like a quick overview. Um, there's a request for uh, more frequent sewer maintenance. I, I assume that means that there's been maintenance uh, issues with the sewer system, that there's dark areas that need more lighting, uh, repairing and maintaining existing playground, checking long-time park car. Well, I'm not sure if that's something uh, the city can do, but if, if there's any uh, the last one, sir, checking long-term park car and a guest parking for registration. I'm more concerned with the um, deferred maintenance of, of, the, of the facilities, and I think this is in part at least uh, raising that concern. Uh, they're also stating inadequate security for speeding um, and, I guess, for uh, parking. There's um, a danger that is being uh, expressed here for ingress and egress from the main gate. Um, I believe that in the past we have had some control over whether residents are maintaining their property or not. Are we doing that still? We um, provide a notice to the residents if they are not maintaining their property. Well, there and are... we provide notices to any cars that may not be um, parking um, in compliance with the um, guidelines mm. and our policies. And we do um, ask that the residents let us know, let us <coughs> being the management know, um, when they find cars that are maybe are parked a long time um, or, you know, in, in the wrong place so that they can provide the um, notice or they can figure out what house or what unit that they're visiting so that they can let the um, owner know that okay. um, they need to talk to their um, visitors. Apparently, uh, some of the residents don't believe that these issues are being appropriately addressed by the city. Um, that homes that are not being maintained and vehicles, I guess, that are parked there for a lengthy period of time. Also, that yards are full of weeds and debris, okay. and I think there's some pictures here showing some of that okay. condition. 
Um, the streets are in bad condition and park lighting not sufficient in some areas, trees overgrowing, a lack of follow up on park inspections, and the entry gate is backing up. And common areas are not being maintained. Now, I, I realize that because uh, there hasn't been an increase in a period of time that perhaps that's the reason that some of these things aren't being done. But the other side of the coin is if the things aren't being appropriately maintained, then why would we be asking for an increase at this time? Um, and, 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 I, and let me just express one other issue. Um, I'm trying to understand the fiscal impact. It says $72,768. Is that what would be the increase on an annual basis if we pass this uh, raise? For the three parks. So it's, it's the, the um, $8 per unit is a minimal okay. impact. And then uh, as opposed to $10,000 expense. And the $10,000 expense is um, trying to put a maximum, I, I'm trying to guess what um, the requirement would be for a subsidy program. Okay. Because so, it's coming out of operations. So it would be, it would be coming out of that also. So we okay. had to address both um, items that we were requesting. So net, it would be a, a sixty, a sixty-two thousand dollar increase in revenue to the city. Um, I, I, to the parks, sir. To the parks, to yes. The parks. Um, so I'm just wondering whether, at this point in time, unless we address the uh, issues that are being raised, and I'm sure there's others. Uh, whether and so that the residents in these parks are assured that these corrections are going to be made, that we at that point uh, consider increasing uh, these rents. Um, I mean, I think that they're raising some very significant problems here. And even though $8 a month doesn't sound like a lot, it still is an increase. And uh, if if the residents aren't getting what the city is supposed to be maintaining for them and, and, and delivering for them, then perhaps this is not the appropriate time to raise this money. I'm just asking you. Okay, the Housing Authority has met with the residents and the last two years and to hear what their concerns are. They have raised the concerns of lighting and we have increased and changed the lighting in different areas of the park to address that so 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 we are addressing them as we go and the lighting um, we are finding that even though they've addressed many areas of concern we're finding there's other areas that um, still need to be addressed so that was brought to our attention and the management is looking at those areas to get those addressed um, uh, we do let me see they, they regularly go through and after the rains the weeds come up very quickly, but they are addressing them. But there is a time between providing the notice and giving people time to address the concerns that are provided in the notice. So it may not be a, an immediate um, change in the appearance. But we do, they, they, the management does address that. They do address the cars. If there's, um, they're required to park their cars within their driveways that can fit those. And they do let them know if, you know, if they have two cars. Um, but they are able to park their cars in um, the extra spaces if they have extra cars. Because many units may have started with small kids. They now have teenagers. There's more cars for the unit. So there are the extra uh, parking spaces where they may park. Um, the trees, we have um, had a, uh, approved by um, the Housing Authority Board uh, the agreement with uh, Tip Top Arborists. And Tip Top Arborists have already gone in to the mobile home parks to do a tree inventory of the, um, of the, the trees in the common areas. And then the next step will be to do the inventory of the trees in the spaces to address how to get a maintenance plan in place for what we have. So that's a step we have taken that is, uh, we've been more reactive in the past but we are taking a proactive approach, and, but it will take time for it to implement and to make a difference. But the council did approve that, I believe, by about October, November, and they have already um, started um, the process of the inventory of the three parks. Um, let's see. The entry gate is very close, um, so that if it backs up, it would back up onto, um, if this is boulders of the lake, 
it would back up to Avenue S. I think there's um, more room at Ranch 1 and 2, so they do not have the same um, length of, um, or an issue with the length of backing up of cars. Do you know if there's been any accidents because of that back up into the Avenue S? I'm not aware. I'm not aware, but we can look into that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I had some of the same questions about the deferred maintenance and hoping that these costs would help cover that. Um, yeah. my council, uh, Eric. Sure. Um, so I think we all have the same concerns about what we see here. Um, the feedback that I've been getting is a lot of the residents don't mind the rent increase, but they want to make sure that they're getting their money's worth. And I don't know if I feel like they feel they're getting that now. So we're all concerned about that. Um, my other thought is this came to us a couple years ago. I think, what, what was the term you used, Mayor Bishop? Financial uncertainty on the horizon? Right. Well, Gus, no offense, but the guy with the nicest suit in here just said it's been rough for him the last couple of years. And if it's rough for him, imagine how rough it is for everyone else. So I didn't know we were operating under a financial certainty at the moment. That, that risk is still on the horizon. So I'm wondering myself, is this the right time to do this? It really doesn't seem like a lot of money, but for an individual it is. So my question to the city manager, is there any other source? Is there anything that we can do to make this easier on those residents? Well, I think uh, Sophia spoke about it a little bit. We're looking at, we have a subsidy program yes. built into this, and we can look in... Go ahead. We can look into the budget process when we put our next fiscal year budget forward. Okay. That's all I've got for you. Thank you for your staff report. Thank you to all of the tenants who are here. It is your voice um, that is the most valuable, I think, today uh, and moving forward as we consider any of these um, types of rent increases that will, you know, absolutely affect your day-to-day. -day. Um, I echo all of the concerns of my colleagues. Um, so to dovetail off of, um, to start, to dovetail off of Council uh, Pro Mayor Pro Tem Loa's um, concerns about um, the operational um, needs, um, do we have, so we, we've got a projected revenue, do we have um, a, a budget, like a line item sort of um, description of what the needs are, projected costs for those, and prioritize those. And so we know, so say we need lighting, we need security, we need, you know, I don't know, weed abatement, we need a variety of things, we need arborists. Do we have a sort of an, an, a, a, a large scale view on what the operational expenses and needs are? The operational expenses and revenues are projected through the city and housing authorities budget process. So those do come to the um, council and the housing authority, rather the housing authority board, um, to be approved each year. They're part of um, the bigger budget that you um, that you see. So we do have um, a line by line um, estimate of what it would cost, what our revenue will be, what our um, expenditures will be, um, whether it be the utilities management. Um, deferred maintenance. We, we try not to defer maintenance. We try to um, take care of everything that we can. But as we stated, the, in, the, with the operational costs going up, but the um, revenue is not, we are at a place at this point in time where the, um, the expenses are exceeding the revenues. And we have um, always stated that they would be self-sufficient when we took them on. So that is what we have tried to um, to uh, maintain, right. so and and that is even with the um, the ten years of no have not having an increase, which is highly unusual in um, I think most settings, that to have that long a term without an increase, given that um, the cost of living does not stop going up. Right. So I guess my so, question um, is, do we have a, like a needs wish list? And if we, we have do. that outlined now, we do. and then cross-reference it with the revenue that's projected to, to generate, we do. so that we can share it with the public, to give them the assurances that 
as this money comes in, we're going to do this, this, and this. So they know it's coming. We're, we, we are not specific. We do have a list of what we do need in, um, in maintenance. Um, it's that the is the bigger items. capital costs, such as um, if retaining walls need to be replaced, um, if pedestals Just with utilities need to be replaced. Those are things that all happen. We have a list for all three parks for those items. But at the same time, we do under, we look forward in the, every year of what we want to accomplish. But at the same time, there are un, um, unforeseen circumstances. And we may have to put something else ahead of it, reprioritize, due to something occurring that, um, you know, uh, the pandemic came in. So, you know, there were, there were higher costs than anticipated. So then we have to change the approach that we have. So we do try to be flexible, but we do try to take care of everything. An example would be we understand about the playground equipment. It's something that we're examining. So in the meantime, if we cannot do a big change out of, um, of equipment, but maybe we can keep it looking good by paint, keeping it, the paint up and keeping it colorful and looking fresh. And so we are looking at um, different ways to try to um, keep it all, everything looking great while we um, slowly build the, the funds to be able to do the bigger items. Yes, and I'm all for finding the most cost-effective ways of making our residents happy and making their homes look as beautiful as they deserve them to look. So just in theory, I guess, since we don't have anything in front of us, in year one, if we were to adopt this tonight, we've got $73,000 in projected revenue. What is that going to cover in terms of uh, the maintenance needs or even the capital costs It will needs. keep the ongoing maintenance needs because at this time um, you had asked about the cost per unit. So I did look at the cost per unit of the income as well as the operations. And right now the operations debt service exceeds what we're receiving in income. Right. So, so what, you, what you're saying is that this money, if we, the rent increase, if assuming we, we approve it, it's not going to get anything new fixed. It's just going to get us. It's going to keep us maintaining at this point in time. But there may be built into our budget are different capital maintenance items. So it may be that because the costs are increasing, we are not able to do as much as we would um, in other years. Okay. And then I have two no other uh, two other. So we are still doing things. Two other related questions but the the subsidy that you mentioned um in the in the staff report it says that in order to qualify for the subsidy they have to provide um uh, some information to about h uh, humini, uh housing and community development income limits and whatnot um but tenants also on an annual basis have to provide certification information could those be one and the same so that people aren't having to do two different processes in order to get a subsidy? If they, if they meet the, the income certification on an annual basis, could we not just then automatically authorize them for it's the subsidy? A, it's a different level of, um, of information that we're asking for. Um, because on one, we're asking people to self-certify what their income is. And with the subsidy, we want to make sure that those that we're assisting <laughs> are those that have no other means to do so. Um, many, um, many retirees coming in sold their house to come to the mobile home parks to be able to live on their fixed income. And we understand that. But we also have not told, penalized people or told them, you can't have a savings to come into this affordable housing. So they may have funds Whereas others may not have any funds because, you know, their uh, situation was not the same. So we want to make sure that we are helping those who, this, is it the difference between, um, you know, they're paying their utility bill, buying food, or is it someone who, um, who can pull out of their savings and take care of it but doesn't want to pull out of their savings? But different people make different choices for different reasons. Um, but we want to make sure that those who we know are going to be struggling with that $8 are the first ones who are helped before we run out of funding. Got it. And we are looking at that. It, it may be next year at $16 instead of $8, being a multi-year, as opposed to um, saying, well, you got $8 this year, you only get $8 next year. 
so we are looking at that and that's why we gave the limit we have to start with and then we'll examine it when we find that we reach that okay and then my last sort of area of, of um, concern was raised by one of the tenants and I think it's a valid concern um, in terms of procedure moving forward I, the staff recommendation is that we remove the rent cap completely um, and so for for existing tenants that means an annual 2% or half CPI and then for new tenants it's a 3% um, is that an, that's just an automatic, is what you're proposing, is that an automatic annual, it's just going to happen without any notification or, they, they get, or, 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 but let me just finish okay, my, my, finish my thought, or is there a way to, um, provide some, some process by which every year the tenants can, we can hear feedback and it's not, I mean, we could bring it back every year, almost like the budget, uh, and if there are no real issues of concern, we just sort of adopt it and move it forward. Um, but I think it's a valid concern that, that you know, if we're just going to remove the cap completely and it's just going to be an automatic increase over time every year, their voices, they really don't have an opportunity for their voices to be heard. So is there a way to build in a process by which we can ensure that tenants come to us uh, on a regular basis or even come to the city uh, to have like city meetings uh, maybe with our two tenant commissioners so that they can at least have a, a space and time where they can voice their their concerns how, how much is the yearly increase again $96 per year $8 per month for, for and then after that first year um, like what it would 2% be it's would 2% be of $408. So, so yeah. it's just a right. little over. It would be $8.20. And for okay. the new tenants, so like the because it's... like 20 cents a year. For the month. new tenants, so because it's... A very gradual increase. Right. 3%, it's 19 It's almost $20 increase. It would, it, yes, it would be more for um, new uh, residents. Keep in mind that the, um, in the parks, we can have 20% low income and 80% moderate income. So there are moderate income people who may be buying the mobile homes that can come in and afford that rent. Right. So it would still be affordable even with a mortgage to them. So we took that into consideration. We do say um, here that we are, that it is subject to review and that we do get, uh, we are asking that the executive director has discretion to be able to say, you know what, this year we, it's a problem and this is what we'll do instead. Um, we did that with the pandemic. Um, we did that with the apartments as a housing authority. For two years, they did not receive a rent increase, but it was in their, their leases so that they could, and HCD still raised the um, rent 7%. The housing authority evaluated, looked at what, that their 7% might cost somebody $100 or $150, and we looked at that knowing that we have low-income residents that that would be a burden to. So we are doing that on a regular basis. We are very sensitive to who lives within our properties. And we do look at that on every year. So it's not something that just happens automatically where we're, we disregard um, and just say, hey, we need income. We look at it and we may make adjustments in what we're doing so that we can do that. But new residents will come in at the highest level. So, it's only the new residents coming in at the, um, what did I say, 650? Six, They're the ones coming in at that level, but we're, we're sensitive that those, all of our residents who are currently there are, at, are keeping theirs at a very slow growth. So I guess I'm just wondering, so you noted that the executive director sort of makes the final recommendation as to whether or not we're going to implement the 2% or 3% increase on an annual basis. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a way it, that maybe three months before that decision is made, we can maybe provide like a, 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 a mailer or a flyer or something, some way that tenants can provide their feedback so at least we're reaching out to them before it just automatically happens. They do receive a 90-day notice. We cannot increase rents without a 90-day notice. In addition, one of the things that we do is we meet with the residents on an annual basis. So we're making, and if we can meet with them more often if needed, if there's some, if we're finding that, you know, we need to have more communication, we can meet with them quarterly every six months. We can adjust that as we go along. Right now we've been doing it on an annual basis. We have not had a lot of feedback um, from the residents. They're always welcome to call the housing authority to let us know if they're not satisfied. 
Um, but we do ask that they speak to the um, management first and give the management the opportunity to address whatever their concerns are, because that would be the immediate um, chance to have it addressed. Right. So it's great to hear that there's already a process by which the tenants get noticed. So could we just do something simple, like attach a little comment sheet where they can drop it off at the, the management's office They're all and we can collect them. I mean, could we just make that part of the process moving forward? When they get their notice, we attach one sheet that allows them the opportunity to say whatever they'd like to say about the potential increase, drop it off at, in a little drop off box, and then the executive director or the manager can, can compile them all, read through them, and take all of that tenant feedback into consideration when they ultimately make their decision to recommend the increase. We can, and one of the other things that um, we have is a, there's a regular newsletter that goes to the residents. So they are provided information on a regular basis, and we can include in the newsletter to remind them that they can provide um, feedback and information All right, in so that I'll, process. I'll jump in here. Leading up to this, I talked to uh, a few of the residents at the parks, most of them long, long-time residents, and they've made it clear that they would never want to move to any other park again because if they did they'd end up paying probably about double the space rent than they would now and i've heard from a handful of people in the community and including the ones that live there that know that the boulders parks in the antler valley are some of the nicest parks you're going to find around and it has some of the lowest space rents and uh, i don't want to thank the housing authority for making that possible over the years and also for having all those meetings because I was informed by the residents that we had meetings at all three of the parks leading up to this and, and had um, decent engagement um, from what I was told about the residents and what they're expecting. And the last thing I want to do is, is raise rent or increase anything, but I'm also concerned about the quality of life, the deferred maintenance, and also making sure that these parks remain the beacon of uh, quality that they've been able to live up to for the last 20 or 30 years in our community. I think it's important that we make sure that these parks remain in uh, good condition and we don't let the deferred maintenance uh, get any further past, even though this is supposed, even though this increase is supposed to keep the operations going. However, without it, we can't handle the deferred maintenance and the capital improvement projects is what you're saying moving forward because we'll have to dip into the reserves to keep the operational funds going as time goes on it's not going to last and then we're going to go in the negative right yes. so um i i'm willing to entertain a motion from council because i believe it's important that we uh we do this and uh, we keep the parks in good condition especially since we have a subsidy program built into this to help the lower income residents with the additional eight dollars a month so, look, I'm open to supporting such a motion. However, I would like to uh, incorporate a couple things. One would be the, the process, by uh, the annual process by which we can allow tenant feedback. It's 786 units. We already send them notice. It's 786 pieces of paper. Not, not much in terms of, of cost or expenditure, but the value of the feedback, I think, is really valuable. Um, so I, I would like to see that implemented. Um, and then also... A, a, a very specific like report back on the cost like what do we need we need lighting we need you know this and what's that going to cost if this is just going to get us you know it's back at square one what else do we need in order to to do all of the deferred maintenance that the and the capital uh, improvements that need to be done I don't, I don't I just want to make a point yeah. um, and I don't know if there's been a review of the streets in these uh, three parks. Um, we're being told here that the streets are in bad condition, if that's accurate. And I don't have any reason to doubt it. Um, it seems like that would be a, a, a fairly substantial capital cost to bring those up to uh, standard, right? One of the streets was um, resurfaced, and what it does need is the story still to be um, put on that. And um, we're working with um, Public Works <coughs> to look at how um, we might be able to um, have that um, taken care of. So we are aware of one park that does uh, need that, but we do evaluate the streets. They take care of any potholes right away, making sure that there's not anything like that. One set of streets is, um, I believe, um, not asphalt. I believe it's like cement. 
um, where two of them have asphalt. So we are, um, we do monitor that. We do make, try to maintain that as quickly as possible so that there are not any issues. Okay. All right, I, and I just want to say, Mayor, um, at this point, it seems, at least in my mind, inappropriate, no matter what, how we gussy this up, um, to make this change and, and, until there is a clear, definite, um, commitment on the part of the city to implement these changes as soon as possible. I, I can't support any increase right now. I think that there's just too many problems that are being identified here. And so I don't know whatever wants to be added to this particular motion. I think that we ought to wait until uh, we have a clear definition of what the city intends to do and that the uh, residents, uh, or at least the majority of them, are satisfied with what the city is being. Like, Ms. Reyes, how long would it take you to put that list together? Like, could we wish bring list. it back next council meeting? The list of like the wish list, like, would but it take and then weeks or months or fi no. financially? If we were to wait, how long would we have until we start dipping into? Financially, we're already um, as of June. Yeah. Um, the uh, as I was uh, answering Ms. Alarcon's, um, Councilman Alarcon's. Um, question, um, currently our operating expenses and debt service exceed what we're receiving in income. So if we so don't we pass this, it's going to, they're immediately going to continue to deteriorate at, instead of improve. Correct. Yeah, but the thing is, I, I get that the idea was for these to be self-sustainable, but in this climate, I don't think that that was achievable. So my thing about the deferred maintenance is it never should exist. If something needed to be maintained, it should have been maintained, and we should have found other sources of revenue to do this. I know what the mayor was trying to say about they're already paying low rates and that they're beautiful parks, but the thing is, I'm still worried about the financial horizon. 2% doesn't seem a lot, but people are getting hit at the grocery store mm -hmm. and at the gas pumps and at the utilities. Mm -hmm. It all adds up. And I just feel for the individual and think that we as a city can do better. Mm -hmm. So I'll make a motion <clears throat> to put this off until we look at this more. I'll second and, it. Thank you. We, we are aware of um, what the different, um, and I have, I did at request, what the different uh, maintenance items are that we need, such as replastering the pool, um, installing an ADA pool lift, um, road repairs. Um, oh, there's some. That's exactly the type of. Information and we understand we have. that we need to have these. Um, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that. The increase is small. It will take care of operations. If we need to find other means to take care of the long-term things, long-term uh, or the bigger deferred maintenance, then if we can get the increase to cover the operations, we can continue to look for these rather than just postpone and then everything is not happening. So it, so, it, so it, it seems like, it, would I ask you how long it would take you to put the list together? You already got the list. I, ha so I have the we, list. Could, it, would there be a problem with answer. bringing it back? Would, would, it, would it be problematic to bring it back at our next council meeting when we have the, the benefit of that list so that we could then think about budget, budgetary-wise? Because the budget is right around the corner. So, what so we Priya, why don't we... My concern is... And, and this increase would not even... Uh, would not be implemented till July. So we have time. Yeah, let's if, go ahead. And you have a 90-day period um, between the notice and implementation. So that, that's... Let's, let's go ahead and take a closer look that. at this and then see what those improvements are and get a little bit, of, little bit more clarity for the council and the community. Um, if, okay. Well, this, this 30 days next enough for everyone to... 30, the next meeting is... Well, let's do two weeks based off that grimace. What? Yeah. <laughs> and then, if, and then with, with that list, so it looks like you've got a couple pages there. Maybe if you could prioritize... Well, each park has its set of lists. Because I get what you're it's saying. It's part of what it is. I get what you're saying, but we also want to add this element of finding other sources. So let's just have this conversation Council, all at once. Council, if I may. Uh, maybe there's an something. opportunity here tonight for the consideration of the increase to cover operations and through our budgeting process we will apply our 24-25 budget to that list of capital priorities. 
Right. I, and I hear you, separate. but I, 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 I also completely agree with Council Member Olson's concerns and Council, and Mayor Pro Tem Loa when he says we've got to put our money where our mouth is and, and guarantee our tenants that we're going to be able to do this at the same time as, as we adopt a, an increase in rent. We've got to, we, 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 for, it's, it's difficult for us to increase rent and just right. say, well, we'll get to uh, it later. I don't, I don't think we're ready tonight. I think we need a little bit more time to dig into this. We can't so, do anything about the other cost of living, but we can do something about this. So that's what we have to go at least a month out. So let's, no, they need two weeks. Uh, so we, do we need a motion to continue? We just had a motion in the mm -hmm. second. Yeah. But um, I'm going to make my motion bring it back in two weeks. Okay. So I have a motion from uh, Council Member Olson. Well, I, All right. I had uh, second visit, but All right, second from Lord. We, we can't live with a, a month. I think we need a little bit more time. They, to... they need it quick. Do we yeah. want two weeks? Or... Let's. Staff needs well, it quick. Oh, we can do this in two weeks, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Two weeks. And I'd like to ask the city manager. Um, we have, I mean, overall, we have a, a large budget for the city for everything. And I know that there's means that can be incorporated to address the deficiencies that exist in the funding right now. There has to be a way where we can address that at this time, where perhaps when the budget comes around for it to be adopted, we can make whatever changes have to be made to backfill whatever money is used in the meantime without having to raise these rents at this time. I know you have a very creative mind in this kind of area, and I would expect that perhaps uh, within the next two weeks you, you would you be able to report Are you suggesting we take this year's fiscal dollars and start implementing no. capital improvement? No. You're, you're suggesting well, I'm, that we budget I'm suggesting, I'm suggesting that, that you, your office, um, and the finance department find a way to address these shortcomings in the existing budget that perhaps could be moved from another account into into this area and then we back, and then we backfill so that when before we get to the before budget. we get into this further discussion let's now that we've continued the item well we haven't taken a vote on, on that piece is, yet so let me so let me just follow up to mayor pro tem's comment um at my thought at least and, and what i heard council member olson say is um next fiscal year, so the budget is right around the corner. We're gonna be taking a look at that um, April, June, uh, so that, uh, because fiscal year starts July 1. Um, and the, the implementation of the rent increase would take effect July 1 also, so. If approved today. If, but if, if approved in two weeks, it would, uh, it would be. wait 90 days, so it would be, a, it would have to go the following month. Yeah. Okay, but in any case, when it, it, it will happen at the same time we're adopting a budget that guarantees that this m money that is needed for these capital improvements and deferred maintenance and whatnot is in, in the budget. They would, they would sort of coincide in terms of timing. We can, we can do both, is I think what um, the city manager mentioned previously, that while we um, work those to be in the budget and look for the funding sources, have this um, go ahead and be able to make sure that the current standard is maintained while we take care of what may be considered deferred maintenance. No, but I, I agree with that, but I also agree with the Mayor Pro Tem. If there's something in this year's budget that we can move around to find the funds to take care of what needs to be taken care of now, we should do everything simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, we have a motion and a second. We're gonna vote on it and I think staff has some direction of what we're looking to see and we can we can work on that over the next two weeks before it comes back to council. Start voting. Motion passes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you we'll see you in two weeks. I want to be clear that the direction was to find money out of this fiscal year's dollars to start ticking items off of the deferred maintenance list for all three parks and but any it and we we can do that that that's what that's what the and we'll have a conversation and, and, and about there's a larger conversation budget. for next year's yes. budget that right. can be built into that so right. to the extent additions. possible this okay. year we've that's got three months left in this fiscal year so it's going to be tough but to the extent possible if we could do one project that would be wonderful but the bulk of it would be next fiscal year
And I think it's important could. to get community feedback from them on their priorities as well. Yes, we have the list, but I think that before we start taking off some of those items, we want to make sure that we have them <coughs> prioritized correctly. So. And can we get a specific report on the condition of the streets and what needs to be done over something in a memorandum? Thank you so much. I, I appreciate your attention. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks, Thank Sophia. Have a good day. All right. So with that, I'm going to adjourn the housing community. I also thank you for everybody who came. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank the members of the public for being patient. It's a very sensitive item, as you can see, but we're taking our time. We're making sure that we're doing it right. Can we can we get someone to adjust the temperature in here? Because I know it's not just me, because I see people I'm in the not. audience <laughs> banging <waiting>. themselves off. <laughs> Was it the rent increase? Was yeah. that making everyone hot? Was it? We were all sweating. <laughs> all right. Miguel's going to gonna turn it down for us. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on to item number seven. That's our consent calendar. So we, we adjourn the meeting so the committee yeah, that just, are still here can go. We just adjourn the, the housing authority. Thank you, housing authority members. Thank you. You can hang out if you want. All right. So. Item number seven, the consent calendar. Council members, would you like to pull any items from the consent calendar? Yes, please. I'd like seven two. Okay. Seven five has been removed. So. Seven five has been removed. Seeing seven two, anything else? I'll move to approve the remaining items of the consent calendar. Mm -hmm. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem, Senate. second by Council Member yeah. Olson. Okay. Let's vote. Thank you very much. Item 7-2, can we get a staff report, please? Economic development. How you doing? Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Roberto Ramirez. I'm the Economic Development Manager with uh, the city. Um, as Mr. Uh, Camacho has stated earlier, uh, over the last few quarters, we had uh, car sales that have been really static. And so we're proposing a program that will not only help increase auto sales, but will also allow us to market other businesses in our community. Uh, we're exploring several initiatives to help launch this program, including advertising on local billboards, running Pandora, YouTube ads. Uh, we're also looking into hosting uh, special events, including bringing back the very popular food truck program on Fridays and doing some holiday lighting. Uh, Incentive-wise, uh, we're considering the gift card program, which was used to encourage gift card recipients to shop local. Uh, we're including our Shop Local campaign with all of our efforts to provide our small businesses with more exposure. We'll be hitting two birds with one, st with one stone, boosting car sales, and at the same time giving uh, local shops uh, free advertisement. For this program, the uh, Auto Mall is contributing $500,000, and the city, with your approval this evening, will be matching another $500,000, which have already been allocated, uh, bringing the program total to $1 million. There are other efforts I just wanted to emphasize uh, for small businesses in the pipeline for later this year. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, Gus, Cam Gus Camacho with uh, the Auto Mall is here as well to answer any questions. Thank you. What I'd like to do now, Mayor, is uh, make a motion to approve this item. And then we can have discussion following. Okay. Okay. I have a motion from Mayor Pro Tem Loa. Do I have a second? I'll second it. I have a second from Council Member Battencourt. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. So let's go ahead and open up discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll go ahead and start. This is the second program. I know you weren't with us before. But this is the second time that the City of Palmdale has explored a program like this, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and some of the questions I asked in my briefing, I'll ask uh, in the public. The money that we're allocating here, none of that goes to the auto dealers, correct? It's all an incentive for people who purchase a vehicle in the city of Palmdale. That is, well, well, that would be the gift card program. But uh, in terms of the funds, uh, really what we're doing is uh, we're taking funds from Measure AV um, and we're using those funds to help launch uh, this marketing program in partnership with uh, the auto mall. Okay. And that's to incentivize people to buy a vehicle here because when they buy a vehicle elsewhere, we lose out on a big chunk of the sales Correct. tax revenue. Um, and I can break down those numbers for you. Yes, so absolutely. I'll give you a scenario. So let's say, for example, a car that is sells for $30,000. Um, 
1.7 of that actually comes back to uh, the city of Palmdale, assuming that it's a resident in the city that purchases the car. Uh, so hence the reason why we're really trying to emphasize the Shop Local campaign to encourage our local residents to uh, shop uh, locally and purchase cars here. Um, going back to that amount, the $30,000, so again, 1.7 of that, 1.75 of that uh, comes back to the city. And so for a car of $30,000, we're getting $525 back um, as a uh, sales tax. Okay. All right, any questions from uh, council members? Uh, yeah. I don't Can have questions. Can we go ahead to the left, please, like we did last time? What? Sure. Okay. 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 I do have sure. questions. All right. Do you, do you uh, have uh, the uh, revenue that's generated by the auto mall for this uh, fiscal year that we're in now? Well, the, uh, so we collect our information from, a, from uh, a consultant HDL. They haven't generated that information just yet because they typically lag about two quarters. Um, but I do have uh, a general idea of how much sales tax we've collected over the last three years. Um, so over the last three years, we've collected approximately $2.5 million uh, in sales tax revenue just alone from auto sales cars. $2.5 million for the three years or each year? On average. That's how much on average? A year. Per year. Per year, million. correct. Okay, and I want to say that um, I think that there was a very disparaging remark made of uh, Mr. Camacho that I think should be refuted. Mr. Camacho has been an upstanding citizen of this community for a long time, his father before him. He uh, not only generates a lot of money for sales tax, as you pointed out, and along with the other dealers, but um, he employs a number of people there. Um, and there is a very positive effect because of his participation here. I think that anything <clears throat> that is stated uh, on attack on the character of Mr. Camacho is slanderous. It's inappropriate for this chamber. We have rules regarding personal attacks like that, and I've seen over and over again individuals come in here and disparage other individuals here. But it was absolutely uncalled for to have that kind of attack on the character of Mr. Camacho. I've known him for a long time and I know him to be a man of integrity. And if we adopt this, it's going to continue to help us in bolstering sales tax revenue for the city that has very generous effects on how we dispense services to all our residents here in Palmdale. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Elson. If I buy a car in Valencia and register it here because this is my residence, who gets that sales tax? So we, based on the, uh, the breakdown, um, we get a percentage of that. So we get, um, we get 1% of that, um, but we don't get the uh, 0.75, which is a measure AV. Okay. So this is basically making sure that we get all of measure AV, maximize that completely, and get that, what is it, 0.1%? Uh, the measure AV is 0.75. Point seven five. but how much on top of that do we get in general, just because isn't it based on residents? I'm not sure I understand your question. The city manager knows uh, exactly what you're asking. So we get 1.75% of the sales tax on any car bought here by a resident here. If, they, if you should buy a car down in Santa Clarita, we get the 1% um, and not the 0.75 that is covered by Measure AV. Right. So what I'm saying is we're using Measure AV funds to make sure that we generate more Measure AV funds. That is correct. So it's not money going to the car dealers. That is correct. It's That's money going to marketing or promotions to make sure that we, we generate continue more to get money. more of that those uh, those sales tax credit. Okay. I just wanted to make that clear. Yes. Um, we've done the incentive program before. We've done a gift card a gift program card. before, correct? Can you maybe share how successful that was and what it did in return? Um, I wasn't here at that time, so I don't have those numbers, um, but I can definitely provide you, get some more of that information um, and provide that for you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I can speak to that. I'm sorry, just really fast. I just want to make it clear that this is not something that we're considering doing just for Gus Camacho. This is for all of the auto dealerships. Right. This That's benefits right. the, the group. The, the Palmdale Auto Mall. So I want to make that clear that we're not putting money in the pocket of, of Gus Camacho. This is for all of the, the dealers that, that sell cars within the Animal Valley and the area and, and the events that they, they 
participate in, in that area. So I just wanted to make sure people knew that it wasn't just Gus, that it's the entire group of the, of the yeah. um, dealers over there. And, and one last thing. We get a, a little over 6% of 1% in property tax. Very little property tax comes back to the city. Our bread and butter is sales tax. And the car dealers are the number one generators of sales tax for us. So that's what this is about making sure that we continue to invest in those that generate income for us. Well said. That's going to be pretty simple. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for your, your presentation mm -hmm. and your staff report. It was very well written, and I really don't have questions. Um, I just want to make sure that I am understanding what is contained in the staff report and make sure that my colleagues understand where I'm coming from in terms of where I'm going to go. Um, the report notes that we're, this program is a million dollars, right? Correct. And we're investing half a million, and, and, and the eight auto dealers are investing the other half a million. Correct. Correct. Um, what is projected in here, it says based on a 10% increase in sales, is a return on sales tax, in an, is a return on our money of $225,000. So we're putting in half a million dollars for a projected return on investment of $225,000. Now, I'm not, I'm not an MBA, but that doesn't sound like, you know, the best investment uh, in terms of return on our dollars, because we're getting less than half of what we put in. Um, so that's just my, I just want to make, that is correct, right? That based on the report, it's 10%. That was a very, just, you know, very modest projection of 10%. I mean, obviously, we're hoping that we're able to get a lot more. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to also emphasize that in addition to that, Getting the exposure that we're getting for these uh, for the the auto mall and the uh, auto dealerships, we're also going to be highlighting. We're going to have a landing page where we're highlighting our local businesses as we're marketing this uh, information out there. Uh, we're going to basically say, "Hey, you know what? We have our shop local campaign come out and support our local businesses as well." And so the idea is that we will put together this landing page where we have information about our small businesses, contact information, so that people uh, have something that they can come out and support our local businesses as well. Right, and so the five, the 500 that we're putting in, the half a million that we're putting in of Measure AV money, 160,000 for, for promotions and giveaways, 170,000 for marketing, and 170,000 for special events. That's what's contained in the report. That's correct. So my, I really don't have questions. Um, this is more an opportunity to engage my colleagues in a policy discussion um, that they've heard me talk about before but measure av money is our taxpayer dollars we 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 sold it to uh the voters and the residents of the city of palmdale that we were going to provide essential city services in four categories public safety one of them is economic development in our economic development measure av budget this fiscal year we've expended fourteen thousand dollars less than fourteen thousand dollars on local business retention that I'm assuming that money goes to small businesses. And aside from that, we've spent $27,000 on film and tourism. Other than that, we have spent nothing to support the small businesses directly. And while I understand gift cards are wonderful, um, but I know small businesses are dying. And I mean, with half a million dollars, we could do $10,000, $10,000 direct grants to keep some of these small local businesses, family-owned businesses afloat. I mean, I, I just, uh, promotions and giveaways are wonderful, but particularly when we're um, looking at a $225,000 um, increase in sales tax when we're investing half a million dollars of taxpayer money, um, doesn't necessarily seem like a win-win uh, for us. It, and then also, just, just let, me, let me, we've got 170,000 residents in our, in our city. 65,000 of our residents commute every day, at least an hour, most of them down below, uh, to and from, uh, because they have to, because that's where the work is. In the case that their car breaks down, sometimes they have to decide whether or not you fix your car or put food on the table. Or maybe it's they have their kid gets sick and they need to pay for a copay that they didn't expect or medications or some other emergency expense that they weren't quite planning for because they live paycheck to paycheck. I've, I've noted that, that many times that we don't fund through Measure AV 
uh, food distribution programs. So, so for, for somebody who has a car breakdown, but they have to fix their car because otherwise they'll lose their job. But then because they fix their car, they don't have money to put food on the table. I've been at these food distributions on a very regular basis. These are working families with kids in car seats and grandparents in the car. They're just trying to get by. And I've asked the council um, to, to support and fund food distribution programs, which would cost no more than $200,000 per year, a fraction of what we're, we're proposing to, to give to uh, the, the auto mall. And yet, every, every time I raise the issue, the response is we don't have funding or there's no grant program or there's there's a lot of you know a lot of ways to say no all right i'll, I'll go ahead and jump in no, wait i'm not done i'm not done um <laughs> oh. so i i just i have i have real um concern with when we are measure av economic development we're we're, we're proposing to expand half a million dollars um, for promotions, giveaways, and special events at the auto mall that's only going to get pro projected to, to generate $225,000 uh, in sales tax. And we've $14,000 for the small businesses. There's got to be a better way that we can use this economic development money. Um, not, maybe there is a way that we could think innovatively. And so, for instance, maybe the, the auto mall can give, they, they've got mechanics on site. Maybe we can do vouchers for people who need to fix their cars and they get the work done there. So then the auto mall generates that business revenue. But we're also helping residents who are just trying to get by. I mean, I, there's, I just think there's a better way of going about this because, as, as Councilmember Eric Olson said and Mayor Pro Tem affirmed, people, I mean, even $8, we were talking, you know, for about an hour about $8 increase per month. Half a million dollars of, of our taxpayer dollars, you know, and, and with all due respect, and I, and, and I love what you do, and I, we, I know you are an upstanding man, and this is absolutely not uh, any personal indictment on you. This is just a matter of budgeting priorities. People are hungry. We've got to fund those food distribution programs. People are just struggling to get by. So maybe we can work with the auto, auto mall, give car repair vouchers, and then people who, who, who demonstrate that they have a job, but their car broke down, they can go get their car fixed uh, at the auto mall. It generates revenue, but it's a direct, inf it's a direct benefit to our residents. I just think this program, and while it was in effect last year, uh, you know, may have been a, may have been a, a benefit in some way with gift cards, um, but I don't know that the, the half a million dollars in promotions and special events and marketing efforts uh, is the best way to spend our Measure AB money. So I would I would I would hope that this council is at least open to exploring a different model. Um, for this half a million dollar expenditure, we can do something else, something that that makes more sense. I'm not sure how that model looks like. I, I would love to support everyone um, as far as getting their cars fixed and stuff like that, but I think that trends a little bit on gift of public funds. I know that when you do purchase a vehicle with this program, it does rebate the uh, the person who purchased the vehicle five hundred dollars. Is that correct? Yes, if we were to go with the uh, same uh, details of the last program, uh, yes, uh, that gift card program uh, rebated um, the buyer of $500, correct? So I know it's it's designed in mind to help and incentivize people and put a little bit extra money in their pocket and rewarding them for keeping their, their purchase and, and tax dollar local. But I guess the point is if you've got money to buy a car, you're doing all right. You're doing better than most. And <laughs> Well, some of us have to buy cars. I, I don't know if you realize, I was driving a truck that was over 20 years old. And then I got a medical condition that did not allow me to even raise myself into the truck. And I had to have a vehicle to get to work. Right. So we're not just out buying vehicles because we want to sometimes. Sometimes people have to buy vehicles. Yeah, have you seen my car? It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't so function. I, 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 know, I know the struggles that people go through. I, too, was a single mother. But sometimes people do have to, to buy cars, and I would hope that if yeah. people buy cars, they buy them local. Uh, I, I, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was going to say, oh, you go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. So I think what we're doing is we're looking for um, the best way that we can put in money into uh, the community, such as the auto dealers, uh, that is going to, one, 
maximize the amount of sales tax that's being generated. And so if we spread, for example, um, fifty ten thousand dollar grants or ten fifty thousand dollar grants, we don't even know whether there'd be any impact in resulting increase in sales tax, right? Uh, correct. I mean, I think it would be based on you paying very close attention to each one of those businesses that receives those grants and sort of identifying where they are from one year to the next and whether there's been an increase in sales or not. And the reality is if Excuse the business me, goes am, under, they am, make no sales the tax. Floor. If the business well, goes let, under, let's they excuse, make no let's sales let mayor, tax. Excuse me, I have let's let's let Mayor Pro Tem finish his thoughts. I mean, you can go on forever. Um, so the point that I'm making is, it first, as you point out, it would be tra difficult to track that from year to year as opposed to the tracking that goes on with the auto dealers. And we know that they're the largest tax sales tax generator that we have in the city of Palmdale. So it's money that would go toward putting money in the place that would bring about the best kind of result. I know that you were very conservative in your estimates in the report, but I expect that that is going to be uh, a better scenario than you even have anticipated. So everybody claps and, and hooray, uh, but the point that, that is being made here is that we can get more money for the needs of the city. And by the way, we have food distribution programs in the city of Palmdale. The uh, insinuation that we don't have programs for distribution of food is improper. We have saves and there are many other uh, distribution programs that don't rely on gifts from the city. Um, so I think that we put the money in the way that we can generate the most money so that we can do better for the uh, delivery of services for our residents. Would you agree with that? And, and also, can I say, Richard, too, I'm sorry for interrupting you, I do oh, apologize. No, um, these dealers employ a lot of people. They, there's, there's all kinds of people. There's sales people, there's maintenance people, there's okay. car washers, there's janitors, you name it. There's every kind of job available at these dealerships. I would hate to see these dealerships go to another city and we lose all of those jobs for our residents because nobody wants to travel to 14 if they don't have to. If we can keep local jobs here, I'm all for it. Another thought just popped into my head when he said that, is that we have a high commuter population here, and, and when people drive a lot of miles, what do they need to do? Get a new car. You need to get your car serviced. So usually when you buy a car at a dealer or, or where, where have you, you, you get your car serviced locally, um, preferably at the dealer. But that creates jobs and a lot of economic activity that hasn't even been configured in, your, in, in the report. Is correct. that correct? Correct. So... Just food for thought with uh, Laura's comments. May I? Yeah, you can. Great. You may. Thank you. I think we're conflating a lot of things here. Yes, there are people that cannot afford a new car, but there are people that are going to buy a new car, and we're trying to make sure that they buy it here so that we can maximize that revenue. Just because we help the car dealers does not mean we can't also help individuals and small businesses and other people. There is enough money in the funds that a half a million dollars to the car dealers doesn't wipe us out from being able to take care of other people that need our help. And it's important that to we notice can do that both. we get two and a half million dollar sales tax from these these auto dealers at the Palmdale Auto Mall. Was that, was that what was said? Yeah, Correct, on average. Yeah, Correct. the large, one of the larger sales tax revenue generators for the city. Right, so I agree that we've got, I mean, this year's anticipated revenues for Measure AB is $22.9 I agree. We have plenty of money to go around to be able to address community organizations' needs and economic development needs. But there's got to be balance. Right now, in our economic development Measure AB budget, the $500,000 expenditure for the auto mall, I mean, dwarfs the $14,000 for, for business retention. I mean, there is nothing in here that says small businesses, like some program for subsidies. And to, it, to respond to Mayor Pro Tem's uh, concern about small businesses, if the businesses go under, there is no more sales tax generated from those small businesses, right? Yeah. And those small businesses go under, they also employ a variety of people, and so those jobs go away. 
After the pandemic, small businesses were the hardest hit. And we see all of the businesses along Palmdale, go to drive up Palmdale Boulevard and you'll see these businesses are shuttered. People are letting, you know, they may have five employees and it's like heartbreaking to them to let one go at a time. And they're just trying to stay afloat. All I'm saying is half a million dollars for the auto mall. It, it, wonderful if we, if we want to keep that, but also put a, a half a million dollars towards small businesses. That's no one's going to fight you on that. But that's not in the budget. I, I think it's Council. important. I think <laughs> it's, it's not real in quick. the budget. I think Council it's important Council Member, if I we... may uh, provide some clarification. Uh, so we looked at numbers. So a lot of the efforts that we put into uh, doing throughout the year are combined. Um, so typically, you know, it's one thing doesn't necessarily just fit into small businesses. I mean, a lot of our efforts are combined. And so with those efforts also comes support for small businesses. And so we did a calculation internally, just sort of a rough estimate. And so over the last year, we've calculated that we spent over $1 million directly for small businesses. And so some of those examples include the small business advertisement campaign that we talked about. We also talked about the small business grant program, uh, the small business training program as well that we provided this past year. So you know, just sort of a rough estimate of what we calculated this past year that we spent on sm small businesses. Right. It's just not Measure AV. It's okay. also funded from the general fund. So we've got a lot of these programs in place, and I think it's important to notice, I wanted to touch base on what Mayor Pro Tem said uh, before we call the question here, is that we, we do have a food bank. We have SAVES, ladies and oh, gentlemen. Yes. It's 40 years that SAVES has been around providing food to just not Palmdale, but it's the South Antelope Valley. It's South Antelope Valley Emergency Services, and SAVES has been there for a long time. We continue to support SAVES and fund SAVES and make sure that the resources get where they need to go. Same with the, the business grants. It's just, I know there's a small amount allocated for Measure AV, but it's other other buckets of money, like the general fund, like you were talking about, that raw. So, so we're not we're not trying to leave anyone behind. Right, and that was my final, that was my final point. Question. You can call, well, I just want one, one final thing to say. I think there's been enough filibustering here. I think we've I'm had plenty of discussion. We know where you stand. And I call for the question. I'd so like to make one, one final there? statement with regard to SAVES. Yes, SAVES is a wonderful program. But what people don't know is that SAVES requires an application and approval process. So in the circumstance that I sort of illustrated, if somebody's car breaks down and they have to decide whether or not they fix their car or put food on the table, they don't have time to Mayor, come fill out an application and bring it. I call it. for yeah. the question. So call it the doesn't question. We've already the heard this argument ad nauseum. <laughs> call for the question. All right, we're going to call the question and go ahead and vote. Motion passes. All right, thank you, thank you very much. All right, that takes us to item number eight. That's going to be a public hearing. City Clerk, will you please read the resolution into the record? Adopt resolution number CC 2024-022, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palmdale calling special election regarding alteration of the rate and method of apportionment of special taxes for the City of Palmdale Community Facilities District number 2022-3, Ritter Ranch Phase 1 Public Facilities. Resolution number CC 2024-023, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palmdale declaring results of special election and the City of Palmdale Community Facilities District number 2022-3, Ritter Ranch Phase 1 Public Facilities, determining that alteration of the rate and method of apportionment of special taxes for the district is lawfully authorized and directing recording of amended and restated notice of special tax lien. And resolution number CC 2024-028, a resolution of the City of Palmdale, of the City authorizing execution of agreements relating to the issuance of special tax bonds for City of Palmdale Community Facilities District number 2022-3, Ritter Ranch, Phase 1, Public Facilities. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. So this is now the time for a public hearing in this city council's proceeding for the alteration of the rate and method appointment of special taxes for community facilities district 2022-3. Before I formally open the hearing, Madam City Clerk, have you received any written email protest from any owners of the property in the district or registered voters who reside in the district who wish to protest against the alteration of the rate and method or appointment of special taxes for the district? Mayor, I have not. Okay. 
The public hearing is now officially open. Madam City Clerk, have you received any requests from the audience to speak on this matter? There are no requests for this item to speak on this item. Okay, so at this time I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Okay. So I'm going to ask if we uh, can consider the adoption of resolution CC 2024 022. Move to adopt the uh, resolution as stated. Be before we do, can we just, that was a whole lot of gobbledygook. Is, is there someone who could just put it in a nutshell in really simple terms for the public who might be watching and want to really understand? Well, can we, you know, I think it, the, the procedure should be that we make a motion second, then we can have a discussion. Okay, sorry. So if we could have a motion to that, please. Okay, and then we'll defer to Janelle and then she'll explain sure. exactly. I just wanted the public to Yes, I'll to that. Yeah. So could we have Transfer. a second to the motion? All right, so I have a motion from Mayor Pro Tem, a second from Council Member Olson. Thank you. Let's go ahead and get a, uh, a brief report of exactly what this is, where it is, and who it affects. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. Janelle Sampson, Director of Operations. The item before you tonight is a continuation of an item that was brought before the Council in February, um, where we introduced the amended rate and method of apportion, apportionment for Ritter Ranch. Um, and this item here, there's a series of resolutions. The first one here is to conduct the public hearing to accept testimony on the rate and method of apportionment and call the special election. Um, we'll then move into declaring the results of the special election and the third resolution is to adopt um, a resolution relating to the execution of agreements in preparation for bond issuance relating to the Ritter Ranch developments. Are there any specific questions I can answer? I'm available and we also so, have... Can, can I go? I'm sorry. So, for the public, so we understand. What exactly, um, when it says alteration of the rates and method of apportionment for special taxes, what are the special taxes for? How will that money be spent? So the special taxes are for, um, these are for the facilities um, relating to Ritter Ranch properties. Um, so those special taxes are it's a part of your property taxes that you pay into um, sort of like a Melarus sort of tax. So it pays for the facilities and the amenities um, relating to that development. So like if they have parks or a fire station or, because this is a development that has not been built yet. So That's correct. We're trying to make sure, if my understanding is we're trying to make sure that we have the money to pay for those facilities correct. once this project gets started. Correct. And the rate and method of apportionment, um, the reason this is coming before you now in preparation for bond issuance, um, the developer is getting ready to move on this. Um, and we want to make sure that we've accounted for the lot sizes, the property sizes, and we have accurate um, special tax rates that make sense for those properties and that we account for changes in anticipated property values and such. Thank you. This is a property, uh, a, a development, a uh, the housing development has been 20 plus years in the works. So we've been talking about this for quite some time. So it's yeah, nice. Yes, like 27 started, what, 1993 or 1995? 30 years. Yeah, my, same age as my daughter. Yeah, so this is, it's been around for a while. It's nice to see this finally start moving again, and, and it's going to help meet some of those housing needs that we have. We're all those lines, uh, Mayor. Um, so the question arises, uh, taking this step, is it going to actually help us start getting these houses built? Absolutely. Uh, this step is, is necessary before we can move forward with the next steps, which would be the bond issuance um, and funding of the development. Yes. It's basically a mellow ruse, right? In a sense. That's just an <laughs> word. Well, it's, I, I say know. that because it's a term that a lot of people are familiar with when you're shopping for a home. But nobody likes it. <laughs> That's true. But it gets so let's not done. say it. But people know what it is. Okay. So we're going to move forward. So. At this point, I'm going to ask the city clerk to open the ballot submitted by the owner of the property in the community facilities district and announce the results of the election. Mayor, can we go back to item five? Yes, we to can. To adopt that resolution. Okay, so the city council then considers an adoption of resolution CC 2024-022, a resolution of the city council of the city of Palmdale calling special election regarding the alteration of the rate and method appointment of special taxes for the city of Palmdale Community Fields Facilities District 2022-3 Ritter Ranch Phase 1 Public Facilities. So, and we have a first and a second. Yes. We have a first and a second. So, so if you can start voting. 
Let's vote and post the results. Motion passes. Unanimously, thank you very much. So at this time, I'll ask the city clerk to open the ballot submitted by the owner of the property in the community facilities district and announce the results of the election. The ballot is voted yes, Mayor. Okay. The results of the election being in favor of the levy of the alteration of the new rate and method and apportionment of special taxes for the district, we may now proceed with the final actions for the community facilities district. So at this point, do we uh, need another motion and a vote? Yes. Okay. So I'm willing to entertain a motion to finalize this. No, a second. Second. Motion and second. Go ahead and vote in the computer. Okay. And, and post. Okay. Start voting. Motion passes. All right, passes unanimously. All right, thank you very much. That takes us to item number nine, non-agenda public comments. Now's the time for public participation on all items not listed on the agenda. Each spe speaker is allotted two minutes in total. Madam Clerk, do we have any speaker cards? Yes, Mayor, we do. We have Eugene Hernandez. Um, I'd like to thank um, Rochelle Scott for reading the riot act. Again, I, I have forgotten how it went, and I forgot that it's on the agenda every meeting. Uh, I had no idea that some Weasley um, city employees are in the pocket of a billionaire, and um, I think that's very sad. I, I would like to say that that the council here um, should should take into account the poor people of, of Palmdale, not just the millionaires. You know, it, w w I was at a small claims court in Lancaster, and there was a attorney paid by Camacho, and she was issuing judgments after judgments against poor Mexicanos who had the misfortune of buying Camacho products. And I felt so sorry for these people uh, that had stumbled into Camacho and all their money plus their cars was taken away from them. I, I thought that was the saddest thing I've seen in courtroom. But of course Camacho doesn't care. But I'd like to just bring up on a different point. I was here last Wednesday for the, the library board meeting and it turns out that Although they meet just once every three or four months, none of them showed up for the hearing, you know? And if these library board members that you appointed don't bother showing up for their own meeting, you should appoint other people. I know other people will be interested in being on that commission, myself included, but there's things that I wanted to tell them about the library that it's not, not responsive to the Chicano community, and I was not able to do so. And I think that that's a very big problem that you should have. Reappoint new members that will show up. Thank you. All right, next speaker. We have Vivian Daniels. Hi, Vivian. Hello, I'm Vivian Daniels. Thank oh. you. Good evening to all of you. Um, I'm a resident at the Palo Verde um, Senior Apartments on 10th Street East. And I'm here because I just want to inquire when is the street going to be finished? Because it's been over a year and 10th Street East has been, it's just sitting there, nothing's happening. They partially opened it so we can come in on one side, but the whole other side is all, no one's working on it. I go walking over there every day and nothing's happening as well as Avenue R. And I just want to know what's going on. Because when I call, no one answers the phone when it comes to that. And also I just want to know if the bus stops are going to come back. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're not supposed to respond, but... I just had a conversation about that today, and maybe later we can have the city manager, not tonight, but give an update on all that, because I asked the exact same question today. So we're, we're do, thinking the same way. Do you think we can give an update tonight, or yeah. Lynn can come up at the end of public comment? That's fine. Okay, well, Lynn, so hold, hold that thought. 
Lynn will come up. We're going to get through public comment. All right, Lynn, just come up. She Just do it now. She's ready. While it's fresh. <laughs> Lynn Glidden, Director of Public Works. Um, Avenue R, I know, will be complete sometime in November. That was the last status that we gave. It is still currently on track. Um, the uh, storm drain work is almost complete. Once that is complete, you'll start seeing a lot more pavement being done on the north side. They will then flip over and, and do the work that's needed on the south side. That's the curb gutter sidewalk that was already put in on the north side. So that work, once all, this, all the infrastructure in it, will go a lot faster. 10th Street East, I don't have a current update on that one, but I know that the phase that is along 10th Street East should be open to the public probably, I would say, in a month. And then, then you'll see that Avenue Q9 will be worked on because we're putting around about at 9th and Q9. So it's, it's kind of a three-phase, four-phase project. All right, thank you. And if you have any questions, I have a card. Thank you very much. May, All right. may I respond to one point? May yeah. I, as a uh, director on uh, Alamo Valley Transit Authority, I assure you that the bus stop will be reinstalled. Okay? And it's very important to provide the bus transportation system here. And uh, Mr. Olson and myself are both directors on that uh, board. Thank you for that right. question, though. Thanks for coming out. I know other people have that same concern. It's never fast enough. And thank you, Lynn. All right. Racine Next. Ector. We can move on. Kristen Woods. Yeah, move on to the next. Kristen Woods. Rodney. All right. Rodney. I'm sorry, thank you. All right, take your time. Oh, you just thought that it was going to be her first meeting. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, wow. Hello everyone, I'm Racing Actor, resident here in Palmdale, Chairman, Councilman. Um, I would like to introduce to you guys Palmdale Knights. This is a community football organization for the youth. They've been doing it, the mother's been doing it for 30 years. Her son has been the lead coach. Hold on, just had a baby, you know. <laughs> okay, but um, they came here today to present to you um, some of the assistance that they might need. The teams and the coaches, the parents have been coming together to help the unfortunate kids who's not able to play. They've been coming out their pockets. Unfortunately, they haven't had new equipment for a long time. Some of this youth have to share the equipment to have other kids to be able to play. I know we're over in your district, your area. And, um, they need a guidance to where to come. And I said, these are your constituents here in Palmdale who represents you guys, and this is where you come and let them know. Um, we've seen you and your recent help with the other youth league that just recently happened to have an incident. And I said, you know, Miss Alicon, this is the people that you reach out to. Um, I just want to give them praise because they're keeping a lot of our youth out of the streets, giving them something to do. We all have uh, also another parent, uh, coach, who has the Antelope Valley track team. Um, my daughter has run on the track team as well. And this is what our community looks like. It takes a village, and this is the village that's keeping these kids occupied, on a good path, something productive to do in our community, and they need assistance. You know, we know West Side get a little bit more money than the East Side, but we're here. We're here. Um, it's a lot of youth out here. We know we have a lot of foster kids. We have a lot of youth that you know might not do good in school and needs a productive and positive outlook with something to do here in our city so um i just wanted to introduce them to give them some lead i'm just a community activist get my voice out and i want the i want you guys to hear their mission statements they do have a budget list um do you mind if we give it to you guys yeah can you Would share you like it with the you? can you yeah. share your that list and then um your contact info with the city clerk to your to your right. Okay. And also, are you, are you a nonprofit five hundred five hundred three? Yes, no. they are. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so so share that. Okay, you want to pass these off to them? So yeah. This is their letter. Share that information to the city clerk to your right, 
and she'll distribute it to us. They also have a fundraiser link as well to help with the Palmdale Hawks. Um, one of their council members, I mean, one of their coaches, I'm sorry. Knights, sorry, Palmdale Knights. Um, it, it gets nerve wracking being up and talking to the mic. We get it. Listen, I'll, I'm breastfeeding. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> I can definitely yeah. get off of work. You're good. You're good. Um, absolutely, thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, I just want to give you guys an opportunity to meet and hear some of their stories. We also have some of our youth, some of the kids who participate on the team, and they can contest to, you know, how good Mr. Rodney, his mother, and his wife has been with the kids. Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, some kids are unable to participate in these sports due to the financial hardship of, you know, some of the single parents or two-parent households here in the Valley. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to give every kid an opportunity, keep them on the right path, keep them occupied during the summers, keep them out of trouble, and, you know, to have a safe place to go. Um, I commend these coaches and the mothers of these teams. They load their cars up, pick up kids, you know, they travel, they get them to where they need to do. You know, we, we donate and we're passing around cleats and, you know, jerseys. And this is something that we need that they haven't had in a long time, you right. know. Equipment. Thank you. So, so, so praise the Lord for what you do. Thank you all for yes, what you do. Yes, give me a hand. Hand. Couple, couple questions. What is the age range of the kids that you serve? Um, I would like to let them come up and speak to that. Um, I know I only had two minutes, so I just wanted to give the introduction. So all the... I actually have several speaker cards for this. Oh. Yeah, so I have several so speaker cards. Yeah, thank you. It's good to see some fresh faces. Yeah, I, know I, I said that. We're very interested in hearing yeah. Yeah, so it's a, I didn't know if you were just going to give me the two minutes, so that's what I had, all the parents and coaches. All right, come on up, coaches. Come up, little moms. Did, Everyone did come anyone, up here. They have to sit and listen cards? to our banter listen. about <laughs> Patience is a virtue, you know. So uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the, the team, um, their coaches, and their parents, and just let you see and hear some of the wonderful oh. stories that they are doing for the community. So thank you, guys. Okay. Did, did okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to start calling the names. Um, so um, Rodney what? Woods. No, you guys can stand, but I'll go Rodney Woods. I just want to make sure that everybody gets a gets a chance. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. You're, just just give me your name. Okay, just give me your name. My name is Tamisha Warner. I am, um, I'm here to represent the Antelope Valley Youth Athletics. Um, we started off as a track club. We've been in existence since 2006. Um, we have since then branched off to add on a cross country team and now a football team. The football team has been under our umbrella for about two years now. This is the second year? Fourth year, I'm sorry, fourth year now. Um, we're desperately needing help. Um, one of our, over the years we've witnessed incredible transformations, uh, troubled youth that have turned their lives around, excelling in school, and many have gone on to college. Um, one of the most rewarding aspects of our work is seeing former participants return and volunteer, giving back to the community that once supported them. Um, the, whole, the whole reasoning for our program is to simply just keep the kids off the streets and away from drugs. Okay. And I think we've all combined have done an awesome job doing that. Um, but it's rough. Mm -hmm. Ever since the pandemic, it's been very hard for us to keep it going. I think everybody on this panel here can say that they've come out of their pockets to sponsor a child that whose parents did not have it. And we don't want to turn anyone away. So it's like, okay, let's all put our change together. You know, sometimes, you know, I had to tell my husband at one point, at one point we have to stop because I'm now taking food off of my kids' table. And, but we never did. We kept going, you know, and we're, our track team has about 150 kids. Our cross country team just started, it's about 30 kids. But our football team started with maybe like 100 kids and now we're looking at almost 200 kids. That's 200 kids we're keeping out of the system, off the streets, and 200 kids that we're keeping these policemen from having to take to jail. And I think that is worth some help. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Dolores Wirewoods. Um, 
I'm a long-standing member and supporter of the community's youth football programs. Okay. For many years, my husband and I, we ran, which was the Little Rock Youth Football. Okay. Um, and we have dedicated ourselves to running what we ran the Little Rock Youth Football and Cheer program, which has provided a safe, nurturing environment for at-risk children in our community throughout the Antelope Valley, because it wasn't just for out there, it was for everywhere. Since the beginning, we faced numerous cha challenges, but none as significant as the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite our best efforts, we were unable to recover from the financial strain caused by the pandemic. And sadly, we had to suspend our operations. Throughout the years, we have often had to use our own resources to keep the program running. We have recertified O helmets and purchased numerous equipment, shoulder pads, shoes, the practice pants, the game pants, out of our pockets. We have done whatever it was necessary to ensure that every child who wanted to participate could do so. Regardless of their financial situations, we're provided with safe equipment to each and every child. We firmly believe that organized sports play a crucial role in keeping children in the streets and away from negative influences. But it's not fair to the children in our community whose parents cannot afford to enroll them in an organized sport to miss out on this opportunity. My son, Rodney, my daughter-in-law, Kristen, have brought the program that we were reaching. I gotta finish reading this. Okay. All right, okay. go ahead and finish. Okay. Um, back that we, my son Rodney and Kristen, that we have brought the program, they brought the program back, not in Little Rock, they brought it to Palmdale, okay? So, um, and in hopes that you can provide us with the support we need to revive our program with your assistance, we can do, we can continue to positively impact the lives of our at-risk children in, the, in this community and the Antelope Valley and give them the opportunity to thrive. We are confident that together we can make a difference in the lives of these children and the community as a whole. Thank you for considering our request and we look forward to your support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Okay, I'm Kristen Woods. Um, this is my husband, Rodney Woods. And as you know, we're a youth organi football and cheer organization. And not only do we serve the Antelope Valley, but we also have kids coming from Roseman, um, from um, Kern County, from Santa Clarita. And so as a licensed marriage and family therapist myself, when we were looking at developing our mission statement, some of the things that we focused on were developing at, not only athletes, but also building character, teaching life skills to at-risk youth. So um, this also includes our foster and homeless youth. So if you're familiar with the area, I work at Tamarisk Elementary School, and you should that community is very low income, so we have a lot of athletes coming from over there. So we focus on integrity, respect, relationship building, and the overall social and emotional well-being of the youth, in, in addition to academic excellence, achieving academic excellence. So a couple of things that I want to highlight is that this past season, we had seven teams. We had over 150 kids in our programs. Of those seven teams, we had three teams that went to the Super Bowl. Two teams went to regionals. One of our teams won regionals, and they had the opportunity to travel to Florida and play on a national level. However, because we could not afford it, those babies did not get the opportunity to go out there and play and compete at such a high level. Why didn't you us? <laughs> so with that said, um, Many of our families who participate in the organization cannot afford to pay, and we have not turned not one child away, not one. So we charge a small registration fee compared to many of the or other organizations in this community, 
Um, those fees cover the helmets, the shoulder pads, the equipment that has already been discussed, so I won't go into all of that. But our number one priority is safety. And so we want to make sure that we can purchase new helmets for these kids so that they're playing and they're playing safely. Um, one of our biggest challenges has been losing athletes to the west side, um, the, such as Highland, because of inadequate equipment and um, funding. So we are in need of help. We are asking for donations. Your contributions will help provide scholarships to indigent and low-income families who truly cannot afford to pay. And so we appreciate any donations that you can um, give to us. Like my mother-in-law said, we've come out of our pockets. I have five children, but I have over 100 that I birthed, and I have over 150 babies, okay? And so, <laughs> so we just want to keep this program going, and your financial donations are right. truly appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who's next? How you doing? I'm um, I mean, um, me and Rodney also took the our teams together and drove from San Diego up to Fresno and played all the teams that we can get a game with, and beat everybody pretty much. <laughs> you know, came home with the big trophy. But my thing is the camaraderie in the community because I live in I'm a homeowner. I own my own business. I've been in prison, and when I was in prison, I made a vow when I got out here. Because I've seen children coming in up under me that I was going to dedicate my life to the youth. So I've been coaching over 20-some years now. And um, I see that it stops a lot of drama because if all these kids are together playing football and they get somewhere else, this kid's going to be like, oh, no, don't do that. That's, that's Rodney's son or this is Coach's son. And so by bringing the community together, we stopped a whole lot of problems out here already. I have four children of my own and six grandchildren. And I just had one that's four weeks old, so I'm going to be around coaching football for a long time, you know. And um, I think the, um, it's real big that we keep our youth, you know, going because it's, it's real hard out here to, to, um, to teach an old dog a new trick. But if we get these kids all together and they start having camaraderie, we can build our community up to where it'll to where last. You know, I bought a house out here, so I'm going to be here for a while too, you know. So that's, that's really what I wanted to say, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, I got a question. Are they playing flag? No. Full tackle. Full tackle. Oh, one more thing. One more thing. That, we what? also, we, um, 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 Josh Kelly on the, uh, on the San Diego Chargers comes from our youth program. Devin right. Williams, Baltimore Ravens. Speedy Gonzalez with the Minnesota, Speedy Richards at the Minnesota Vikings. So we're producing stars. So what you guys are doing are making an investment because just like some of these other athletes, once they make it to the top, they get out and come back and help their community. So this is really an investment. You're investing in these kids. Y'all not giving them the money. <laughs> I got a new respect knowing it's full tackle now. <laughs> yeah, we got more than that in the NFL, right? Now. All right, next. Hi, good evening. Hi. My name is Sarah Sanders. I just wanted to speak um, as a parent in testament of this program. For the last three years, my three sons have been part of the Palmdale Knights organization. And for some context, I live on the west side of Palmdale. And we have access to programs closer in proximity, but my sons only want to play for the Knights. Before we moved out here, we used to be part of a football program in Valencia, and I will say wholeheartedly that that Santa Clarita program doesn't compare at all to what my boys are being taught day in and day out by these dedicated and committed Palmdale coaches. The level of development and passion that, are, that they're learning is unmatched and unmeasurable. My sons are being challenged daily. They're learning hard work pays off that resilience makes the difference, how to stay disciplined, and most importantly, how to show up and show out. That no matter what, to give their best effort to be a team player, be respectful at home, school, and on the field. I'm so proud to be part of an organization that cares so much about the youth. It's easy to say you care, but to witness it is a whole other ball game. They don't turn around kids, I'll tell you that. I've seen board members sponsor children, sponsor merchandise, buy cleats, give uh, shoulders to lean on when parents are going through tough times, and that's all testament of the heart of the program. The youth is the future, and all these children deserve to have the same experiences as my sons have had. They have gone to places um, I never experienced as a, as a child. We've gone to Oregon, traveled all around Southern California, back-to-back -back Super Bowls, gone to regionals in San Diego, Vegas multiple times, which might sound minor, but for some of these kids out here, they've never been out of the county. 
and I would do anything for my children um, to have these experiences, and every child deserves the same. So please consider donating to the Palmdale Knights football organization, to a program that doesn't just go through the motion, but actually cares, not only about the well-being of these children, but the successfulness of their futures. All right, thank, thank you very much. Right, we're going to finally hear from one of the, one of the kids. Yes, please. No pressure. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name is Malachi Sanders. I am here to tell you about Palmdale Knights. It's a great youth football team. The coaches are incredible of helping you get better and not to be scared of anything in your way. But we need new equipment and we need to, the cities to support. Thank you. All right. Cool. I got, I got a question. What's worse, public speaking or getting tackled? Can I ask you a question? Would you like, what, what was worse, public speaking or getting tackled? Public speaking. Yeah, I, would, I would have to agree with that, too. Hi, my name is Romel Simon. Coach Romel, everybody call me Coach Ro. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I honestly enjoy this moment of being around my council member, meeting them, the mayor. Nice to meet you. Um, my experience, I didn't know anything about football, and, um, I came to this program, and it changed my life. Um, not only do I can't go nowhere in Palmdale without, hey, how you doing, coach? They made me a coach. Um, it made me a man. Um, my son looked up to me. Um, now, I mean, I'm a stepdad, but I came into his life. And now he looks up to me. You know, um, the program is not only affecting me, but it's affecting him as well. Uh, my, my wife, she's, she was just left, she was here, but she don't know anything about sports, and now she love it. You know, um, just to be able to, you know, participate in the community and make a change in these kids' lives. Because at the end of the day, it's not about football. It's about making that young man a better kid or that young woman a better kid or, you know, in school with the education, stuff like that. So this program has helped me, um, my perspective of life. I'm kind of like him, you know, I come from the bad side, you know what I'm saying? But this program helped me change my life around. Um, I got saved. Um, I started my own business and uh, I'm about to get married. So Congratulations. thanks to the Palmdale Knights. I know it might sound like a cliche, but part of this is making sure that these kids are their best on and off the field. On and off. On and off the field. Yeah. All right, next speaker. Uh, hey, guys, I'm uh, Gregory Grimes. I'm one of the coaches as well. I started off as a parent, and uh, I've seen how everybody came together, and they're so welcoming like a family, and... One year, well, the first year as a parent, I wind up wanting to help so bad. I they they had me help them as a uh, assistant director, uh, AD, uh, and from there we we're able to hands on help these kids not only learn how to um, play football but how to get along and socialize and um, make sure that these kids are having the right attitude, having the right uh, mindset and respect because respect goes a long way, uh, especially as you're growing up. Sometimes we get lost in um, all the things going around like uh, TV, YouTube, TikTok, and start thinking things are normal and then no, you got to realize no, that's not normal for a kid. This is what's normal for a kid to actually be a kid and live. And uh, it was just an uh, honor. So this is going on my third year now that I've, I'm actually a coach now. And it not only helped me uh, and my sons and my daughters, because they were on the cheer team too, uh, it's helped everybody develop. And that's what keeps us coming back. That's what helps. That's what keeps us wanting to show up to practice, wanting to show up to games, because I've been in uh, other sports and, Sometimes when you don't have that leadership, it's hard to want to go to practice. It's hard to want to show up. And that's one thing you have to respect here is, like, everybody is a family, and it, they treat you like that. And, and, and 
it, it, sh- it shows the kids that, hey, like, there's more to life. There's, um, there's hope. There's hope. And that's, I feel like that's the best thing that we could give a child is hope uh, for a better future. So. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, council, chair, uh, mayor. Okay. I'm Rodney Woods. Um, I'm kind of soft-spoken. Um, um, I'm the president of, of the AB Knights. Um, I come here to, to just explain on what we do here, I mean, what we do as a program. I'm really, um, I'm a people's person, so I love people. I love kids. I love to give people opportunity to win in life. Like, um, my coaches, I, I I, I get them from everywhere, uh, from liquor store, wherever. Anybody that want to change their life, I'm, I'm here. I'm here for it. So um, our, our program, we we teach a lot of discipline and uh, just the life skills. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's more than football where we come from. Uh, we do develop kids football wise, but we try to teach them how to how to get through life. Also, uh, discipline, um, focus, paying attention, um, being on time, being punctual, and things of that nature. So. Um, we're just a, a program looking for some help, you know, from, from our city. And um, hopefully you guys can help us. How long, has oh, your, and, and, how long has your group been together? Um, we, we started, well, I, I started running a program in 2021. And then, so we've been together okay. since. Okay. But I've been coaching for 17 years. Okay. so my I'm mom, just shocked that this is the first time I've heard of you. We, we need to do some advertising. I think she I, said that the, during the pandemic they had to shut down. and Right, for Little L- 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 Rock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so what, we're, we uh, we were originally out of Pete Knight High School. Okay. So then Palmdale's, uh, Palmdale Falcons youth football folded. So we ended up uh, coming over to Palmdale okay. and uh, becoming a feeder I'm program. I'm just so happy today. you're here. I so. didn't even know you existed until tonight. <laughs> right. So okay. I'm glad you're here. It's, it's great to see some fresh faces at City Council getting involved. Right. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you guys. All right. Any other speakers? Anybody else? Any takers? Any other speaker cards? Anybody? Marsha? I would just like to say thank you guys again for hearing them out. You can listen to the stories. The youth come up and speak as well. And thank you for your time and your opportunity. So don't leave yet. Don't you leave yet. Don't leave yet. Can we may I, may I respond? Just so offer brief remarks. I, there, you, you know you're live, right? we got cameras watching you. Hey! So I want you to tell the people at home how to get a hold of you if they want to make donations. So for anyone who is looking to make donations, um, we do have a um, page. Racine's going to pull that up for us here. But also, you, we on our sponsorship letter, you can reach out to Rodney Woods. His phone number is 661 sure you want to give that out to everybody that's watching? <laughs> well, it's public and public. <laughs> <laughs> okay. do, do, do you have a website, maybe? Yes. Yes. So they have a youth. It says Fun Youth Sports. And there's a link, and it's a sponsorship opportunity for the Palmdale Knights. Um, I'll I'll give that to someone, the link, uh, okay. at the end of this meeting. Okay. Can you yeah, potentially but, get that on our website? Right. Right. Oh, yeah, what about the players? Yeah. Same thing? How do they contact Same thing. Okay. Same thing. So you can reach out to your coach, or if you see any of the coaches in the community, stop them, get their information. I'll give the link to you guys okay. so that um, anybody else would like to donate or fund or anything, I'll pass that information to Rome. Um, we can leave a few more of the yeah, letters out to let okay. those get around. Okay. And um, we're looking to have a great season this year. And we also have our email. That's AV for Antelope Valley Knights. That's K-N-I-G-H-T-S Youth, Y-O-U-T-H. F C, F is in football, C is in cheer, right. at gmail.com. So, so before you guys leave, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you. Thank you for all you do and all you have done and all that you are committed to continuing doing with or without our help. Um, you truly are the unsung heroes yeah. of our city. Heroes and sheroes. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. To you, we owe a debt of gratitude. You guys said it was your honor to be here. It is our honor to be in your presence yeah. because you guys are providing. A couple of you guys talked about uh, you having the opportunity at a second chance. But what you guys are doing is giving these kids a first chance. 
Yeah. So that they don't need a second chance. So that they're on the right trajectory Absolutely. from the outset. So you guys are to be commended. Thank you for all that you do. You came here to request that we support. I can only speak for myself. I would hope that my colleagues join me in this. But you've got my commitment. I, I will work with you and figure out how I can help. Uh, and I would imagine that, that other council members are going are gonna to jump in uh, to, to contribute as well. But we will work together uh, because we are stronger together. Absolutely. And our kids are worth it. Yeah, we say it takes a village. That's and right. This is our village. And, and now, now that you're here, you know that you can come to us and let us right. know That's because we're you here to help too. That's right. right. Absolutely. Okay. And also, I did want to share our website. Mm -hmm. It's AB youthathletics.org all right thanks for coming out uh, okay and say one more thing yeah of course because they're playing in my district and the thing is i recognize some of the coaches uh james right james and i even play with my boy rocky rocky you should be asleep so i know a little bit about what you guys are doing and i'm proud of what you're doing and i pledge my full support to what you're doing at Thank a you. very minimum, I'm going to be a platinum sponsor. Uh, Thank you. We will work. So we will work to see what else we can do. And I just want you to know that um, the city is fully invested in youth and sports, and we're doing a whole uh, sports turf analysis. We want to bring back sports tourism to Palmdale. We want to make, you know, give a path to the youth in Palmdale, and we're working really hard to bring all that to fruition, um, and we need partners like you, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We will definitely be in touch. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. It's a good school. Yeah, we're going to be winning. All right, do we have any other speaker cards out there? Yes, we have Felix. As all to everybody. And thanks for coming out. contact for more because we're going to be at Palmdale High School so Thanks for coming out. All right. No more speaker cards at this time? No more speaker cards. I know we got Marsha. Hi, Marsha. Hello. I'm sorry to say that the VA will not pay for me to have a fresh face in this council meeting. So you'll just have to have the same old one that shows up all the time. Okay. World War II brought to light those who would stand up, hand held high, and went off to do the jobs that needed doing. They came home, put their uniforms in a cardboard box, and got on with marrying their sweethearts and building up America. I had four uncles in World War II, two in the Navy, one in the Army who brought home a Purple Heart, and one in the Army Air Corps who didn't come home, making my grandma a gold star mom. My dad served in the Army Air Corps, no Air Force back then, and is buried here in Desert Lawn Memorial Park. In approximately two months, Memorial Day will be recognized, and I'm here to make sure our city steps up to honor those who did their military service, no matter in war or peacetime. While we should always remember and support all veterans, Memorial Day is a quiet time for reflection of those who are no longer with us. Just as a point of information, if you don't come up to your microphone and speak, we cannot hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Marcia. Any other comments? Saying none.
All right, so I'm going to move over to item number 10, council reports, announcements, and requests for future agenda items. I'm going to start over to my left here. Councilmember Bancourt. I would just like to ask that the city manager, when she has the opportunity to, or, or maybe Lynn, gets, give us an update on a more regular basis on the, the road construction. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I want to report uh, that we had a very successful trip to uh, Washington, D.C., in my estimation. Um, we had uh, Councilwoman Betancourt, you, Mayor, myself, and then staff, including our city manager. Um, Nardi uh, went along as well, and uh, um, gosh, I'm blanking. <laughs> Terry Zayas. I, I, I learned a lot yeah. at that conference. So one, one of the things that that we learned about was the um, different workshops that were held and seminars, and one of them was the uh, uh, transportation director, uh, Budovich. And of course, we were going to Washington because our primary thing that we've been asking for now for going on 25 years uh, is the road separation at Sierra Highway and uh, Rancho Vista Boulevard. Also the grade separation at uh, Avenue M and Sierra Highway. It's been long overdue. So we had an opportunity uh, to hear about uh, sources of money for those things. And then we followed up by meeting with staff members of different congressional offices. Uh, we met with the uh, staff of uh, Senator Alex Padilla and, 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 the, and, the, and Senator uh, Butler, yes, Senator Butler. Um, and they were very gracious, uh, and uh, I, I thought we made some good progress there. Um, I, I didn't see this because uh, I, w I went to another meeting, but apparently uh, President Biden spoke to uh, the entire National League of Cities. It was uh, uh, very well attended national conference of cities from across the United States. I did have the opportunity to go to uh, the meeting that the California League of Cities delegation had in um, inter interacting with Senator Padilla and Senator Butler. And um, I brought up an issue, I, I, I've known Senator Butler, I mean Senator uh, Padilla for, for many, many years since he was uh, fresh out of high school. Um, and uh, I, he gave me the opportunity to ask a question in front of all the delegation there regarding mental health and fentanyl. So actually the senator uh, has uh, created a special uh, program nationally to address this problem and he gave a he gave a very significant address to all of us that were there and then senator butler took up the issue of fentanyl both of those things are being addressed at a, at a national level so it's significant for us to um to tap into those sources because this money is out there there's a lot of money that has been budgeted and uh we need to step up and and uh and get our our, our share and I know that uh, Ms. Perez and the rest of the staff are going to be, um, I want to say exploiting, actually, the, uh, the opportunities that are out there to get money to come back here. Uh, so uh, I thought it was time well spent. It was a good trip. Um, and, uh, and we had some good, good interaction with, with, with folks there. And, and what Richard, the one of the breakout sessions that I attended was the um, military and defense uh, families communities. We talked about all of the funding and grant opportunities and some of the new programs for for military families in, in at the federal level. It was very informative. There's a lot of money um, that we can apply for in competitive grants, and, and I know that um, our chief of uh, staff was taking notes feverishly on on how to get this money and how to get these services for our local veterans. So it was very very informative. Yeah, to speak to that, I was in a handful of those same meetings, and I think it was very beneficial. We went there and had some face-to-face -face meetings, a few of them. Uh, a few of them that are important for us to tell our story and, and talk about how some of the roads around Plant 42 are in dire need of upgrade as more jobs come to that area, uh, specifically with the B-21 being underway. But uh, a few grants in particular, one I'll call out was the RAISE grant, which uh, very competitive, but we... We look like we check all the boxes that could be up to 25 million for the city of Palmdale, and that's just one of the grants we talked about. And in addition to two other grants that are out there from railroad and uh, 
and from the congressman's office who we met with as well. So it could it could be well over 30, 40 million dollars for improvements for those roads that are desperately needed to get the employment in and out of that area who are building those bombers and those airplanes that keep our community safe, that keep our entire country safe. So we were able to make some connections, tell a good story, and uh, get some good feedback from the people, uh, the federal grant people in Washington saying, hey, you guys are an excellent candidate for these grants. You guys are checking all the boxes and thing look, things look good going to the next year's budget. So very promising, very needed for the city of Palmdale. And I'm looking forward to seeing what comes of it because those trips are extremely beneficial as we can bring home millions of federal dollars into our community. All right, I could go on forever, but I'll <laughs> move on to Eric Olson. Now, how do you compete with that? that everything's coming up Palmdale, right? Like, I wish people knew how much improvements are coming our way, how much transportation revolution is coming our way, like how, how booming we're about to be. Um, all of that's great. Thank you all for going there. I just want to give one quick um, shout out and thank you to Assemblymember Juan Carrillo, who's AB 2082, just passed committee. So the city of Palmdale is now one step closer from taking ownership of Palmdale Boulevard. All right. Thank you. That's all I'm I, I could go on for a long time about all the events that I've gone to, but I just, if I could get um, two, two report backs. So I want to say it was about a month and a half ago, we all, there was consensus that um, we would have an agenda item on implementing um, bilingual translation at our council meetings. I don't know when that's going to come back, but the budget is right around the corner. It would be great if we could have that implemented before the budget process so that people can actually be actively engaged during the budget process. I think so, we actually did have that so coming up, right? That, that was requested two meetings ago, so one month ago, and it is a program to come before you at your next council meeting. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So before we move on to item number uh, 11, I just want to say briefly that I am very honored and privileged every day to have an opportunity to serve the city of Palmdale. I think we have a fantastic city, and like Eric said, everything's coming our way. And I know sometimes things may look contentious or it might look like uh, we may disagree, but it's, it's not. We're working for the city of Palmdale. This is a council that cares about their community. And this is how we get to the results that we have out in our community. And Palmdale is a leader in the Antelope Valley. So even though it may look like sometimes we disagree, and, and sometimes we do, but we all come to the table and we all gather and we all agree on what's best for the community. And I'm so honored and privileged to have this opportunity. And I think Palmdale is a wonderful place to work, live, call home. And uh, I just, I really am happy with the city and, and the staff and, and everything that's going on in our community, especially with the engagement that's coming to our council meetings that feel comfortable coming here and introducing themselves to us. It's just really excellent. So I'm, I'm glad we have that kind of comfortable culture where people feel like they can come to us and we can have these types of discussions. Mayor, I'd like to make an additional comment, too. Yeah. Uh, on Saturday, uh, we went to the Boots on the Ground program, and uh, Marsha was there. Um, and I noticed that uh, she gave a very sharp salute. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where she was trained. Were you in the Army or? Ladies, Air Force. Air Force. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I learned something. Okay, well, that's good. I, I learned something every day. But uh, it, it really was uh, a, a very good event. Um, that most of us went to, and uh, to recognize the uh, Vietnam veterans who, after the conclusion of that war, and even during the war, uh, were not treated well by society, and uh, we're, we're still trying to uh, say to them, welcome home, and that's what we did. For so if I could just say something real quick. Um, the groups are wonderful, the veteran groups around here. I went, um, went home breakfast at one, and was told about that's going on in uh, Bakersfield called the Honor Flight. Mm. I don't know if you know what that is. They take uh, Vietnam veterans. Why, why don't you come to the mic so that way it's in the, uh, that way people at home can hear it. I think we hear about the uh, flights of veterans that go like to a place like Normandy when it's a special um, anniversary. But right here in our own backyard in Bakersfield, 
there's a group that gets Vietnam veterans, and they, um, so, so I'm going, huh? World War II veterans have the priority on the honor flight. Okay, well, okay, well, no matter what, <laughs> I'm going. Uh, <laughs> so I filled out the application, and I got the call, and so next month, um, I will be getting on a plane and going to Washington, D.C. for three days, all expenses paid, and seeing monuments, and having a banquet, and getting a shirt and a jacket. And, you know, when I was 18 years old, um, I made the best decision in my life. You know, way back in 1967, it wasn't the thing for girls to do. And... Uh, but I did, and I have, even to this day, 75 years old, and still um, reaping the benefits of that choice. So, uh, anyway, there we go. Thank Thanks, Marcia. Eric, you had a good joke at that veterans event. Did you want to share it? All right. <laughs> All right, yeah, so there was a lot of events this week in the uh, veterans event. We did graffiti cleanup. Uh, I personally was privileged to attend the last showing of Susicle. So no, no shortage of, of stuff going on this weekend. But... Let's go ahead and in the name of time, let's go ahead and move on to item number 11, uh, City Manager's Report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and the events continue. This weekend we have Children's Spring Fest and Egg Hunt at Marie Kerr Park. That's always a crowd favorite. Uh, that goes from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. as well as the Cesar Chavez Day on Saturday from 11 to 4 at Dominic Massaro Park. We've got a Fight Fentanyl Awareness Campaign and Spring Program that's kicking off um, the 26th through the 28th in conjunction with all of our fentanyl partners, including the city of Lancaster. Uh, we've got our safe spring basket distribution and many, many others. Just please visit our website to see all the great things that are going on in Palmdale. A couple of other things I want to announce is we still have the Veteran of the Year Award nominations are open. You can visit our website. That does close on March 31st. We've got a call for local artists to participate in our Antelopes on Parade contest. And then we also have our application period open for our um, certified, I always say it wrong, let me make sure I get it right, certified, Certificate in Applied Positive Psychology, which is the Wellbeing Lab. This is very unique in our city. It is a tremendous program that focuses on mental health, and uh, the work that's being done in the community, actually, A.V. Boga was born out of the right. Wellbeing Lab. Um, so with that, uh, at our next meeting, um, continuing with the momentum that we have before council, they will be considering $60 million dollars in road improvements and infrastructure improvements. Um, they have been a long time coming and uh, the team is delivering. So uh, look forward to sharing that with you at our next meeting. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, item number 12, presentation by city attorney. Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and public staff, we have two properly agendized items, 12-1, which is a, an update on litigation and 12-2, which is a personnel matter. At your convenience, we can recess back to closed session. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to recess, and we'll be back briefly. All right, and we're back. Announcement by city attorney. Um, as to those I'm privy to, the council is updated, but no reportable action. Okay, thank you very much. And as, to the, as to the last item, council was, uh, council provided direction, but there's no reportable action at this time. All right, that takes us to the adjournment. We are going to adjourn this meeting to April 3rd, 2024, right here at the Palmdale Council Chamber Hall. Thank you very much for coming and have a good night. Get home safe.